Good. Anyway, look, I am going to um, talk about um, new formulations of lattice field theory, uh, but actually my basic um, problem is going to stem from the same problem that Dean talked about. For those people who listen to Dean's excellent talks on uh, parallelizing uh, by fourth theory, he's part of this um, project in many ways and places. And so the often the test case of a lattice of a field theory is by fourth theory, it's one of the favorite ones. But one of the things that I want to um, emphasize here is how we uh, define the um, critical point or what is called in field theory now, the conformal point of a field theory. And the classic example is the IC model, which is really a normal field theory because in an IC model, just as it's written down in uh, um, its original form, an IC model is on a grid. And on each grid, there is not a continuous field. There's only um, two states, a spin up and a spin down. And uh, but the point is that there's many ways to get to the same uh, field theory in large scale. And this, so lattice theories have lots of flexibility as to how you might want to um, represent a field theory. And then, of course, how you represent it has a huge impact on uh, the kind of computation you will do because the computer always has some kind of discrete representation. So I thought I would um, start with this um, nice video, which actually is basically um, Last bit of some of the things that Dean did. Uh, this is the IC model. Can people see the um, the vertical um, y-axis here? Yes. Yes. Okay. So you see, I'm running. This point here is the so-called critical point of the IC model. If I put the temperature up, it gets very noisy. Just everything wiggling like um, crazy because they're barely coupled. If they don't couple them at all, it will look like snow, right? And this is doing a Monte Carlo calculation. It's scanning through each site and deciding whether it is probable to flip the site or not. And when the thing is at very high temperature, it hardly cares. And so it just keeps flipping it back and forth. That's not very interesting. It looks like your television set when it's off, going off. Now, on the other extreme, suppose that we rapidly uh, cool it down. Then you see what happens is that it wants to be all aligned the white is, say, up, let's say, and the black is down. But also what you see here is the standard Monte Carlo calculation. It's trying to flip one spin at a time, and um, it is very um, easy to do it near the boundary. Let's go back again. Um, near the boundary, okay. So when you try to flip a spin uh, in which um, some neighbors are up and some neighbors are down. It doesn't know which way to align. In fact, if it's got exactly two neighbors up and two neighbors down, it's equally likely to be flipped up or down. So what happens with the, the algorithm is you spend most of your time doing nothing in the solid areas and all your time crawling around the edges and flipping spins, although you try to scan across the lattice and you try to flip the spin at every point, but you only really collaborate, you only really do it very successfully along these lines. So Monte Carlo calculations are not always correct, but they may be slow. And what um, I believe that Dean uh, talked about to some extent is that there's cluster algorithms. One uh, cluster algorithm finds one cluster at a time and goes out to a distance which the cluster likes to flip. This is a calculation from Swenson, Wang, and then Wolf. So, for example, if I go to that algorithm, oops, that didn't do anything. It's so close to the thing. Okay, let me try again. So this is this is what a Wolf algorithm is doing. See if I can stop it. Yeah. See, this is at the critical point. So there's islands of um, of Republicans and a sea of Democrats, I guess, uh, being optimistic. Uh, and so what the Wolf algorithm does is it tries to flip a spin and then conditionally says, well, if I sit here uh, in a black spin and I'm surrounded with my uh, friends that are all aligned with me, um, I'm not going to flip it very often, but if I convince them to flip at the same time and they convince their friends to flip at the same time, finally you propagate out to a group which decides that conditionally uh, it is in fact perfectly likely to flip. So what it does is it flips big clusters. See this? So this, this is a 
but clearly extremely more efficient in terms of trying to find the long range um, uh, configuration to see how big these clusters are. In fact, you could even prove that right at the critical point, there's a high probability of a cluster that has a finite, oops, has a finite number. Now I've gotten a little bit to the um, disordered phase. Now, uh, that wolf algorithm does it one cluster at a time. Really a very similar one is a scan to do all of them. It's called Swenson Wang. And this is harder to see because each scan, it doesn't just find one cluster to split, it, it breaks it all up into uh, as many clusters as it can. And, but, but anyway, uh, all right. So there's two lessons here. One is that um, real physics doesn't happen at the uh, scale of your lattice. That's um, somewhat your choice of algorithm. It happens at a longer distance if you're thinking in terms of uh, field theories for um, the real world. Uh, and um, uh, yeah, and the other thing is that um, yeah, okay. And the other thing is that you can, if you stand back far enough, you can sort of not think of the individual spins. You can say there's a whole bunch of values here that are say positive, and then a whole bunch of values that are here are negative. And so you can coarse grain this, and that is one. That is the basic argument to show that I didn't have to start with the icing mold at all. I could start it with some continuous density, which when it's uh, in, a, in an area which is, um, uh, has a lot of votes, I give it a high value. And when it has uh, negative votes, I give it a low value. And so in fact, this theory is identical at long distances to a standard um, field theory, the five fourth field theory, which we'll talk about. And uh, so, what we're gonna, what I'm gonna show is that when we first tried to go to curve manifold, we tried to do it with the IC model, but there was hardly an idea of what what meant to be smooth because every spin is either up or down, and therefore there's no derivatives. You can't take smooth derivatives on IC model. And we shifted values. Okay, so let me go now to the basic talk. But but this is the object that I'm studying, and um, yeah, okay, fine. Let me let me get, go back to the. So let me see if I can now shift sharing the actual transparencies. Share content. Is that what it wants to do? I'll try just doing the whole thing. It kind of gives me the willies because I can't see. Now you see this as a big uh, thing now or no? Or do I have to go to um, uh, full screen then? Is that, is that just a help? Yeah, the full screen helps a lot. Thanks. Okay, good. And uh, I don't know why I have this side thing here. Well, let me get rid of that. Oh, but that's still not, um, it's still not the, um, not the matters. It's still not the, um, Um, sure. Sorry, it doesn't matter. I was trying to get it to the um, show on the screen. Show. Well, it doesn't seem to want to do it this way. Is this good enough? It's great, Rich. It, it it looks great. We can read it. Okay, good, good. So it's great for me. It's huge on this big monitor. Okay. So anyway. Um, what I'm going to do is, first of all, discuss rather broad terms uh, field theory. And uh, I have two parts, but I'm not going to get to the second part. As I said to Joel, I, I'm going to have two lectures because I know that one lecture can never be done uh, in one lecture. Uh, I might discuss a little bit of quantum computing, which is now um, part of this project, but um, somewhat of a different uh, issue. If I don't get to it, it's no, uh, no problem. Um, I'm really going to talk about is um, how to write lattice field theories and the advantages and difficulties of doing it not on a square grid on flat surfaces, but on a um, curved space. So uh, here's just a um, making the same point I was just making. The fact is that you can study sometimes the same physics, particularly in the limit of uh, so-called conformal field theories. Um, where you only care about the long distance property in the extreme, 
you can have a square lattice. That's what I was just simulating. And then the um, icing model had spins plus or minus. So this is the representation, plus or minus on each side. Um, and uh, then I'm going to go to 5, 4, 3. So instead of plus or minus variables on each side, I should say in passing, these plus or minus uh, representations are exactly the ones you want to do in quantum computing because quantum computing is want to be translated into qubits and these become qubits. So that's why this discrete thing is very interesting. Uh, but then you can also think of it as a real number, which is sort of the density, how, how much of it wants to be in a neighborhood up or down. Um, you can put uh, the IC model is exactly soluble on square lines. It's actually exactly soluble on a, on a triangular lattice, and I will have somewhat like triangular lattices. Um, uh, and you know exactly the solution. Actually, I don't know if you know the full solution, but you know the critical point anyway. Now, I'm going to go and, for reasons that I'll explain, and put them on a sphere, positive curvature sphere. In, um, in uh, gravity, one calls that the center space. Um, it's a positive curvature sphere. We're also investigating doing algorithms on hyperbolic spaces, which is some um, negative curvature, anti basilar space. Um, so the general topic is how to handle smooth, non-flat spaces. And as you can imagine, if you can solve it on one, you get a hint on how to do it on many. I will discuss almost entirely how to do it on a sphere. And this thing started, shows you how much difficulty we had. This started, um, what is embarrassing a long time ago, since uh, 2013, with Herbert Neuberger and George Fleming, when we were discussing um, whether we could do uh, so called radial quantization. And we didn't think about the 5 4 theory, we thought about the IC model. And we actually did the IC model on a sphere. Uh, the good news is that we got a nice critical point. The bad news, which I will explain, was it really wasn't the right theory. It wasn't the theory on a sphere. It turned out to actually be a theory on a piecewise flat areas of an icosahedron. So that's part of the, the lesson is that we abandoned the IC model because we didn't know how to really put it on a sphere. And then here is the paper, which I thought I would have uh, already published, uh, which is actually, I think, finally succeeding to do that problem that we started in, uh, let's see, 2013. And now, I guess in 2020, maybe in a week or two, we've actually succeeded in solving that problem correctly, I think, um, using the 5 4 theory. So that's sort of the um, funding point uh, of this um, presentation. But let me, so let me uh, start back again where we, where we got. So, and the other thing I want to uh, emphasize, which I'm sure I'm not the first person to say it, is remember that we're doing a quantum field theory but we're treating it as if it were a uh, thermal system. As you saw that icing model, what many people think of that as a finite temperature, uh, magnetic system in two dimensions. There is this wonderful trick, which I hope that many people have, have been uh, warned of, is that while a quantum field theory literally obeys a Schrodinger equation, it says that the probability of all the distribution of objects that can be fields, they can be tracks of particles at time t. The first derivative of it is i times a Hamiltonian Hamiltonian times the thing. That's a differential equation. Of course, it's a very complicated differential equation. It's got uh, a variable, say, on every single site. You may not want to solve it that way. But the point is that formally, you can solve this by just simply integrating. This is a constant. You can exponentiate it. This is a huge matrix, which is operating on this whole set of variables. But the answer is uh, trivial, but that doesn't solve the problem. You have to exponentiate this so-called Hamiltonian operator. And if you um, are have, um, familiar with, with exponentiations of a Hamiltonian, that's of an Hermitian operator, that's what almost all compact groups do. This is now a unitary transformation. So actual, Hamil so actual quantum field theory is unitary evolution in time. I mean, it's just not, but a trick which actually allows you to get a lot of interest in physics is simply to drop the I and to go what is called Euclidean time. And then you notice that this oscillating phase, either the I, T, this would be energies, just becomes a damping. And if you go back to this equation, that means this is a diffusion equation and all of the correlations just fall off exponentially 
there is no complex number in, the, in many cases. And instead of having to think about Mankowski space, which is a hyperbolic space, you, uh, if you like, particles are constrained to a, a sphere. And so this means that quantum fluctuations are characterized and turned into thermal fluctuations. That's important because that means that even if you don't care about quantum filter, but you care about thermal properties because you're interested in condensed matter or uh, various kinds of um, problems in the in materials, every, uh, every single method that we have here is common to study thermal fluctuations because we actually just got rid of all of quantum mechanics. The fact that you can measure things here after this transformation, which are actually true of the original thing, that is, um, that's part of the dark art. But um, so I will do that. Since everything looks like thermal fluctuations, the standard way to sample, sample thermal fluctuations is with Monte Carlo calculations. So, you know, the, the funny thing about it is this is quantum field theory of quantum mechanics. And then everything below this line turns it into a problem, which is um, not you know, obvious. Okay, so now, so here's my problem in, in all its gory detail. This is exactly the um, 5 4 theory. It has a Laplacian term, it has a mass term, and it has a 5 4. Indeed, I believe this was exactly the uh, thing that Dean wrote down. The only thing that you see that is strange about this is that I'm assuming that the derivatives um, have a metric in it and the volume has a metric. So this is actually, uh, to give you a warning, I'll, I'll change slightly this, but this is the, this is the, this is the general continuum classical action um, in any metric background. It can be uh, any background you want, any curve manifold. This is the, um, uh, this is the derivative, I'm sorry, the, uh, determinant of this. This is the density of the integral over the volume. And, and this, is, this is the correct classical option. And uh, then uh, you have to deal with this curved manifold. In, um, very, very little it can be done analytically in, in uh, non-trivial backgrounds. Um, although in, in, when it's fairly simple, you can. The lesson that is generally thought to be true is that if a field theory is a perfectly good field theory, that is to say it has nice Feynman diagrams, it doesn't have ultra-wide divergences, it's all our sacred renormalizable field theories. It is generally acknowledged that something very close to this also exists in a curved manifold, so long as these are smooth functions. All you need to do is be able to take derivatives close to um, uh, you may take small differences, and if this is smooth enough, it locally doesn't notice the curvature, and, and it's perfectly okay. So people believe that quantum field theories exist in almost any reasonable uh, curve background. The problem is that um, on a lattice, we're going to have to approximate this. So the standard approximation is that on every site between i and j, you use a finite difference. We can use a local uh, square for this on every side of the lattice. We can use a local square of this. And then we need some magic weighting factors to have the lattice uh, respond to the actual um, fun functions in front of it. So this is actually um, a very common practice in uh, engineering and applied math when you are not doing quantum uh, theory. But I can just view this thing as a, um, a way to get differential equations. So you can look up a huge literature on what is called finite element methods. And if, if you are brave enough, you can Google it. I don't know, the last time I did it, I think I got 10 million hits, but it might be 20 million at this point. Uh, you actually get more hits on, uh, on um, finite element than you get on string theory. So the string theory is sort of lagging behind used in almost all um, computer codes when you have any kind of complicated geometry and you're solving differential equations. So I want to describe, I will describe what these weights mean, what this means, what this means, what this means on a lattice. Um, so that, that's where I'm headed, but I'm not going to head there in, immediately. 
let me continue with that sort of background here. Um, so let's go back to standard methods. Um, in fact, let me, no, actually, let me, I'll, 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 I'll give you something to one more sort of um, comment. Quantum field theory is very, very important. It's used now throughout particle physics. It's used in condensed matter as an effective theories, and it's under huge um, investigation to what extent it should apply to gravity. It's a highly unsolved problem. But it's by no means just because it's been around for you know, in mature form for easily half a century. There's huge numbers of problems that are not understood. And this is partly because the standard tool of quantum field theory, which is wonderful in recoupling the Feynman diagrams, and those have been refined to the point that we understand quantum field theory when the interactions that take place from the nonlinear terms are separated by fair distance. So particles and modes are both screaming through space as if they were just plain um, free particles and occasionally inter, inter, uh, hit another one. And that Feynman diagram method is, however, as powerful as it is, it's misleading because you cannot look, you cannot do that icing model for um, example, 5 4 theory, just what we did, cannot be done with Feynman diagrams. So there's a lot of field theory that is just beyond the reach of Feynman diagrams. QCD will be discussed, that's a classic case. It's also true that the standard model is really only understood at the level of Feynman diagrams, and yet clearly there must be other physics. And PCD is the one exception in the standard model that we know. Um, we also know that uh, you shouldn't do it in flat space if you really care about gravity. Uh, we can't do a, 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 whole, a lattice theories at all for things that are called vector-like theories. Um, I, as I just mentioned, we really struggle when we can't use this trick to go to Euclidean time. And then finally, this was discussed this morning, we really don't know what it is to have space time in a field theory when you have gravity, because field theories at the short distances have um, apparent huge energies, so-called ultraviolet problem, but you can't have energies in flat space without gravity becoming strong. So I'm just trying to say that there's plenty to do. All of them think the point that field theory is understood, each one of these things could make a career and probably not the young um, side. So, uh, so that's, so Feynman diagrams are wonderful, uh, but we have to go beyond them. Um, uh, so the first way to, the first suggestion to go beyond Feynman diagrams, which was systematically pursued, is in fact lattice gauge theory using computers. It's an old field. Ken Wilson wrote down the basic um, method. 45 years ago, um, and this will be discussed. I will not do the complicated case of QCD. I'll be doing 5.4, but um, it will be discussed later, and it has been discussed so far. Um, and uh, when you get these uh, lattice gauge theories, all you have to do is turn on large computers. Here's the current one that um, my colleagues are running on. Uh, this thing has, um, it does, Many floating point numbers per second, existing machine. It has approximately this many transistors, and this many GPUs. So we are taking our current methods and certainly pushing them at the extreme of technology. Um, but I'm least interested in methods here that um, have not been pushed. Okay. Um, so, uh, so let me. Let me keep moving. I have more slides here, but I think it's probably better. Can can people ask questions? By the way, it's kind of um, bizarre to be talking into a screen with no. Um, there are some questions showing up in the chat window, and uh, most people can mute themselves if they choose to. Um, so I have to get see. I put this thing in full screen mode. I do not even see the chat window. Make it small. Oh, I see. Okay, maybe I can. I don't see this. I do not actually see because I've shared the screen this way. I do not actually see. Um, uh, 
How do I find the chat window? I think oh, there's I a little speech right. bubble. Oh, uh, no, I got the bottom. Okay, I got it. Yeah, I did. If I, the trouble is when I'm full screen, I can't see. Uh, okay, questions. Uh, yes, some, someone asked um, not to go up to me. Uh, typo, probably. Oh, why are you touching my typo? The typo that this person is complaining about. Uh, it was. It was. It was just that. Um, it was like psi of t is e to the i h t psi of zero, and you had psi of zero both times. Dr. Geet was nitpicking. Oh yeah, geez. Where, where do I have it? Oh, I see. I'm sorry. Yes, you're right. Okay. I don't. Uh, the unitary operator should not take me from zero to itself. That would not be impressive. You're absolutely correct. Whoever found that could say a for the day. Um, but to, there's plenty of new opportunities, so don't uh, despair. Uh, well, Euclidean time. Well, Euclidean time means this business of taking, you see, um, Minkowski space, um, time and, um, and space only differ because of a minus sign inside the metric, minus t squared, right? So as soon as you make t into it, in a relativistic theory, all directions look the same. So not only do you get rid of the um, imaginary uh, factor in front of the Hamiltonian, which means that instead of having terribly oscillating um, uh, signals, which are very hard to compute, you get a nice damp solution. Uh, but the other thing you get is that you get actually a simpler symmetry that all directions look the same. So if you were a bug sitting at x equal to zero, t equal to zero, in Euclidean space, it looks completely rotationally invariant. So um, that's a, a nice um, feature. Uh, is there any other question? Um, yeah, the metric is positive depth. That's correct. Yeah, right. So in fact, if you look at the um, the action that I wrote down, um, it's completely positive definite. The the even the um, Laplacian, the second derivative terms have positive eigenvalues, or at least not negative eigenvalues. So it's um, it means that the exponential of this is a well-defined probability, and that's um, distribution, and that's why Monte Carlo can be used for it in such a simple way. Yeah, okay, so, okay, that answers those questions. Let me go back to um, sharing, okay. I don't know. Oh, no, I'm st you still see it, right? Yes, I just have to go back up there. Okay, so, yes, we are using um, Euclidean time. Sometimes people call it imaginary time, which is kind of confusing because that means there's no eyes. Um, and I, and this, this, for example, when you do lattice gauge theory, you have a four dimensional lattice and you can call, um, three of these directions as the, um, the curl for the B field. And then a fourth direction can be thought of as the time, uh, derivative of a potential, which is the E field, but actually it doesn't know the difference between B and E. And it really looks like you've got a four dimensional B field. And so, um, that's, um. Uh, because all directions are the same. Okay, so anyway, um, so let me, um, uh, no, I don't do that. Okay, so I'm going to try to ask what difficulties and advantages do you get into when you have a, um, uh, a space that is not flat, and I'm going to really mostly look at a standard sphere, two dimensional sphere, and uh, how can we formulate the lattice gauge theory on that sphere? so as to get the exact answer in the limit of zero lattice spacing. I mean, lattice gauges, when they're very careful, have a completely clear definition that they want to have it as a definition in principle of the right theory as the lattice spacing goes to zero in the same sense that differential equation solvers are supposed to be good when the grid goes to zero. So um, that means we can look at uh, non-flat space so here are the manifolds. Here's a little uh, quick um, view of it. As I said, um, you can think of, uh, I'll get into this geometry. There's a lot of lovely geometry, by the way, and I want to overwhelm me with it. But if you notice, this is a, um, this is a triangular lattice in the sense that these are triangles, okay? But the actual symmetry of the lattice is better to think of this, sim this lattice as broken up into six smaller triangles because this triangle has uh, three factorial symmetry. 
So actually, you can do transformations that take each of these smaller triangles into each other. This is the fundamental domain. And you ask the same question on, on spheres. Uh, this is a sphere. Now, the, um, well, maybe I should go to the next, the next slide will be, well, okay. This is a sphere, and this is a sphere in which there are exceptional points, the blue ones, which are actually the uh, positions of what would be an icosahedron. Then it's refined with triangles. So this is the kind of lattice that we're going to discuss. Let me um, uh, And this, by the way, is the uh, corresponding lattice that you would have in, in negative curvature. So this is zero curvature triangulation, positive curvature triangulation, and negative curvature triangulation. Only zero um, zero uh, curvature has been really studied well in lattice gauge theory, and it's by far the easiest. Okay. So. Um, I think I'll I think I'll come back to the um, question. Well, okay. So, by uh, fourth theory at the critical point is a perfect conformal theory, and I'm sure that people are aware, or maybe you are, that there has been a huge effort called back to the bootstrap, where people have tried to solve uh, analytically, or at least put analytical um, theorems on top of the conformal theory. Um, and have gotten extremely sharp um, definitions of what the theory is when it's completely in the continuum limit. And so this means that for both the icing model in 2D, which is solved analytically, and you know a lot, but even in 3D, the icing model now has been constrained by incredibly accurate uh, uh, bootstrap conditions. So this means it's an ideal case to study with a new method, because if you screw up, you're going to have a huge challenge with the existing methods. And this is not a field theory. This is just a statement of how the algebra of operators work. The interesting thing is that in this language, it looks like Feynman diagrams, which are only tree diagrams. So there is a basis when we get to the critical point, which the thing is no longer a field theory. You start with an icing model. You start to smooth out and you say, I can think of it as a quantum field theory with a phi fourth theory. And then you get to another point where you're literally at the uh, critical point and it's conformal and it's no longer a local field theory, but it can be solved uh, with various methods in simple cases. And this method has given extremely accurate answers. Let me give you an example. Uh, the cup, there are two, two, two important fields. One is proportional to um, phi itself. This is an odd field. And this is basically proportional to phi squared. And these are the analog of dimensions. This will become, um, uh, um, this is the, the analog of mass. So notice that the claim is that they know the mass to six decimal places, the lowest one, uh, the, the, uh, the, the one that is proportional to phi, the phi squared mass, they know to a, a, equally, they know the next one higher, they know the energy momentum tensor, they know the three point functions coupling phi phi to phi squared, uh, operators to hide a thing. So there's a huge amount of data here. And of course, they're all very proud that they can beat Monte Carlo, not by a lot. Monte, I mean, standard Monte Carlo methods in flat space have been done. Uh, this is, these critical exponents are the traditional exponents. These are the sort of formal language exponents. They're translated into each other. But, and you see that um, uh, they claim that they know these things to a few more decimal places than have ever been done before. I think it's probably true. Um, this is 3D. So anyway, so doing the one reason to do this thing is not only is it the simplest case, it's a case that if you get it right, you can uh, numerically you have a big you can test it. Okay, so so here's the here's the problem. What we want to do is take um, four dimensions. Okay, sorry. I'm, I'm going to put this in two dimensions. So we're going to take a three dimensional theory. So it's going to have coordinates R and two coordinates on a sphere. This is going ahead. This would be okay for the three dimensions. So I'm going to put it on a, a lattice which has one long direction and then a compact direction which is a sphere. I'll show you what that looks like. Yeah, the sphere will start off life being an icosahedron. This is the 
only this is the highest triangulation that you can make on a sphere and preserve a subgroup of the rotations. Unlike the flat, you can put any number of triangles you want, and it's a subgroup of translations and rotations. And then what we will do is we will take these triangular surfaces and we will split them up into smaller triangles. And so we're going to try two things. The old paper did the following. They took this triangle and then it just complete, say, say you could um, draw a line from here to here. You could uh, draw, draw a line here and, and uh, make it into four triangles and then each could be divided again and again. So a, a triangular face can be tessellated with a larger number of, of dots and triangulate. And we solved the icing model on this triangulated icosahedron. What we're going to do is actually distort the triangles on this face by projecting them onto a sphere. And this is actually what they look like. Now, it's, if you look at it, it's really hard. There is actually uh, 12 exceptional points in which five triangles meet. And all the other points are typical like this, where six meet. And in fact, that's an Euler uh, number. It has to be that way. You have to have a balance. You cannot get rid of those five. So if you're very clever, and I doubt you can do it uh, quickly, you could find that there's a few places where you don't have a six coordination. This has six. I have no idea where to find it. Maybe you can find one. Oh yeah, maybe this is it. Okay, this is one of the uh, defects, okay? So there is no regular triangulation. So here's, here's I think I got it. Where, no, where was it? Yeah. I had it went and gone. <laughs> Anybody can find it again gets the prize. There's a defect here. It looks like six. Okay. Anyway, I, I guarantee you that if you tried to triangulate all the points in this, you're going to find there's exactly 12 places, which are the original 12 uh, points of this vertex, which are only five-fold triangles together. And the other ones are six. Now, if you have equilateral triangles and you put six together, you can make a flat plane. If you have equilateral triangles and you try to put um, five together, it cannot be completely flat. In fact, the original uh, icosahedron's example, five triangles together give you a point. So somewhere here, there are slight defects. So that's going to be the story. What, why, why do I worry? It looks pretty good. How do, why do I worry about the slight defect? And it turns out that that's probably one of the reasons that it took so many years to get to this thing, is that we didn't know exactly how to worry about that. So let me, um, uh, let's see. Uh, what, what's the timing here, Joel? Let me see. Hello? Right now it's four o'clock. And um, I mean, you could, you could go to like uh, 445 and then we take like a 15 minute break. Sure, absolutely. Uh, I, are there more questions? I, I, I do find it strange to talk into my slides with response. Are there more questions I should look for? Yeah, Dr. Brower, so the whole the whole tests with the sphere and things, if you're doing it with icing model, you're just changing like which nearest neighbors are interacting, right? And like at the boundaries, you know, how can you interact? Yeah, absolutely. So we, okay. tried, we tried with Herbert. Uh, and it took us a while. To, uh, in, in hindsight, you can see that it can't be perfect. But what we did is we literally took the triangulation of this lattice here, but we put unit bonds between the icing spins, right? So we had an overhaul, usually called inverse temperature beta, which was universal times the product of the spins across each bond, right? So what that means is that we really, from a geometrical or topological sense, what we're really doing is triangulating this flat uh, uh, surface, right? Because the metric is supposed to tell you something about changes of distances, right? But we're treating each of these things, that, uh, neighbors, as if they're just the same distance from each other. Right. What we are really doing is triangulating this, and we're not doing this blow up, okay? So we're solving the left-hand thing. I should have had the triangles. We're solving the left-hand thing with triangles on it. That's all. Now, interesting thing, and this is going to be the story why this happens. When we did this, we got a pretty good answer to the known solution of the conformal theory on a sphere. But it wasn't perfect. 
but it was a conformal theory and we had a perfectly good critical point. We've got clusters that, that exploded out as you saw in that, um, that uh, uh, video. And it was an icing model on an icosahedron. And so, yes, we found the right icing solution numerically on an icosahedron. And um, nobody's actually tried to solve this analytically. What's probably the case is you have to realize that there are little defects at these corners. So it's really a conformal theory with a very long distance defects. And apparently, although I don't know if people really know this from, and people have studied, you know, two-dimensional conformal field theories on all kinds of surfaces. In fact, that's what string theory does. Um, so I've seen some uh, uh, analysis of it, but not totally convincing. But apparently, if you only have a few defects, uh, they, they, the problem falls off rapidly from them. And therefore, you're really getting a critical theory with a few defects. Uh, you know, that's not unusual. You can do critical icing models with boundaries and so on and so on. So uh, we found a critical theory. It was just not the one on the sphere. <laughs> okay. Okay. And just what? also. What? Go on. I, I was just going to say that I, know, I think maybe only the professors here actually have experience with conformal field theory, maybe one or two. I'm lucky that I know basic definitions. So when you have. Um, when you have CFTs with the, uh, like your correlation functions, what's the significance of a conformal field theory? I know I've been able to repeat that it's like scale invariance, but. Yeah, there's, there's, there's various, um, you know, there, there are very mathematical definitions, but let me just give you the, the most uh, the physical thing. Whenever you have a, let's look at the, the magnetic system. What we know is that if the um, temperature is high, then spins are basically flipping independently, namely they're uncorrelated, right? And then if the temperature is very really low, they get solidly caught in one of two vacuum. Either they all go up because they're so strongly uh, agreeing with each other, or they all go down. So relative to that state, up or down, they have very little correlation. You have to always decide Correlations with respect to what? I mean, they're all up, so you could say they're all correlated. But you're you're interested in quantum field theory in the in the uh, statistics, right? So it turns out that right in between is when the correlation length defined this way, relative to the background, uh, goes to infinity. So what's happened the is point. there's an infinite correlation length. So te technically speaking, the conformal field theory is an infinite correlation length. Now what this means is scale invariance is now captured. Because if it's an infinite correlation length, then you don't care what scale you look at the um, uh, theory, right? Mm -hmm. So you get scale invariance. Now, what is not easy to understand is mathematically um, um, quite a tour de force, is that if you have enough symmetry, for example, um, in the IC model, it becomes rotationally symmetric. It's a, it's a piece of the what would be called the Euclidean um, uh, um, uh, Lorentz group. Then it turns out that in many quantum field theories, in fact, it's almost a theorem that basically happens all the time, that once you get scale invariance, you actually get additional symmetries. Uh, and the additional symmetries are inversions. You can take any point and take the position x and then write everything in terms of 1 over x. That's inversion symmetry. And then you can also do what's called special conformal transformations, which is translations, inversions, translations, which is actually also um, a symmetry. So what happens is that your uh, theory ends up having a additional group symmetry, and that's what conformal symmetry is called. But that's only at the critical temperature or critical Generally point. Generally speaking, only at that one point. Okay. Okay. Now, why is this of interest? Because the fact is that, first of all, there are systems that are close to that, but it's also uh, realized that very often um, you can have a theory which is physically not exactly conformal at short distances, but as you go out to infinity, it has an infinite correlation length. So it becomes, if you would neglect the short distance property of it, uh, it is conformal. This is called an infrared conformal fixed point. Actually, I'll show you. I'll show you a, uh, it's a good question. Let me show you um, 
the standard um, Yeah, uh, so okay. lost it. Um, yeah, so. Here, here's the kind of phase diagram that one writes. Um, this is the um, this is the five fourth coupling going up the vertical axis, and this is the mass. And you see what I've done? I've put a minus sign here. So what this is called is the double well potential. Notice that this thing is zero when phi is either plus this, the square root of this, or minus this. So this is the sort of um, Remnant of the icing model. And the icing model is very strict. It says the variable is either plus or minus. This says that if there's a strong double well here, then this is spends a lot of time being close to the positive square root of this, and a, a lot of time being close to the negative square root. So what happens is you can tune um, any of these parameters, but the, here we tune this, and then there is some point in which you get this infinite correlation. So this this surface here is a two-dimensional analog, which in the IC model is only a point because it only has one parameter, beta. So the, the conformal field theory lives all along this line here. Now it's, it's um, a part of, uh, of um, field theory lore to know that this is actually a line and that, there's, that it has a whole line of conformal points, but actually this line doesn't give you different answers. As you come in here, it's called flow. There's really only one point that defines the whole theory. So when they solve it with the bootstrap, they're finding five fourth theory at this one point. Okay. okay. I only solved my first diagram of this yesterday. So oh, okay. Good. So well, I mean, look, I, I don't there's no there's no reason to go fast. I mean, this is not an easy subject. And I I mean there's two things. I want to get a feeling for the subject, which is uh, clearly you're never gonna get, you know, sure. <laughs> yeah. But also the technical difficulties and computational things which are, I think, quite interesting and in, in universal. So I will turn from the physics to the computational methods, which also are not simple, but nevertheless, um, I'm rather universal to doing um, derivative work. But anyway, uh, so I have do you have questions? questions this? This, is, this is called a phase diagram in, in condensed matter. And these parameters would be material parameters in some system. If, you know, in a magnetic system, you'd have some material parameters. This, this thing is the... This is uh, actually, this is the negative mass, which is um, a uh, analog of the Higgs negative mass that gives the instability to the Higgs mechanism, except for in the Higgs mechanism, this is not a single field, but is in fact four fields, all dot product of four fields, but it's, it's similar. Um, and so, uh, and, and this is a standard thing. See, when you have a double well potential, if it's very deep, it lives in one well or the other, right? shallow it lives in the middle and what this line means is that it can't decide it's schizophrenic it doesn't know whether it needs to go left or right or stay in the middle this is this line where the double well potential um is just sort of not strong enough to separate the two things so all of these black and uh white things that i showed in the video they'll get completely separated but it's not um, weak enough that it just gets into freckles okay it's exactly this place where you have these sort of black areas that are evolving and competing with the white areas. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so that's where this line is. Uh, Dr. Breyer, one more question. Could you go two slides back to the, uh, the one with the boundaries? Yeah, yeah this one. Um, so R by T3 versus R by 3S, what are those again? You said they're like the boundaries of okay, like so, anti no, I was just about to describe this. You're, you're getting ahead of me, but that's a good question. Okay. What would you do in a normal uh, lattice? You would usually do a lattice, um, which was, uh, this is done in four dimensions. So let's, I'm sorry, you can, I, I'm just thinking about four dimensions, we haven't gotten to. Let's think of this as a square, and this is a square. So what this is, is this is saying, normally if you had a three dimensional lattice, you lay down cubes in a grid, right? And then you would have it have periodic boundary conditions. 
So what this means is a torus, periodic boundary conditions. Now, of course, in a real world, you cannot do an infinitely long lattice, okay? So actually, this thing, which I call R, really does wrap around. But it's useful when you do calculations for masses and correlations to have one long direction which you can stretch out very long and get a very accurate answer on the exponential fall off which you have in Euclidean space. So for all intents and purposes, I consider this to be very long, okay? And then a normal lattice would wrap this into periodic boundary conditions on a torus. Right. The difference, the subtle difference, but it's important, is I'm not going to wrap these extra, um, you can think of this as a time, Euclidean time in this uh, space. I'm not going to make the spatial things periodic in a flat space. I'm going to wrap them on a sphere. Okay. Now, the, the magic is that at the conformal, when you're at a conformal point, you can solve the theory here or here and get exactly the same answer. It doesn't notice that you've made this change in geometry. What is S3? It, I thought S3 was already like a three tor, or it's a sphere, a three sphere. Sorry, it's a three sphere. But as I said, substitute your mind two here. I should have done this, okay? So I'm going to do R cross torus two would be a standard flat lattice. You see, if you if, look at, think, take a piece of paper. I actually have a camera here I was going to try to use. But anyway, take, take a piece of paper and roll it up, right? <laughs> you can hear me do it, right? And you roll it up into a tube, right? Yeah, so now you've heard this long like, both. Right? So just take your piece of paper and roll it up in the tube, right? Now, yeah. that is actually flat. You may think it's curved because you've got it, you know, sitting in space. But technically, uh, in when you talk about curvature of a space, it always has to be intrinsic curvature, okay? So you can take a flat piece of paper and, and fold it, make it into a, a cylinder, okay? The problem is, if you can do that with one dimension, you can take the, the thing and roll it in one dimension, right? Uh, and the other take to be infinite, okay? But if I have two dimensions to roll up, I can't roll them up uh, without putting them on a sphere. So if this is R cross T1, then this is just a, in other words, if it looks literally like this diagram, this, this diagram actually is a flat space. It has one flat direction like this and one flat direction around. And obviously I can also uh, put a lattice on this of absolute squares, right? No problem. The problem is when this curved direction here has two dimensions and has to be a sphere. Okay. And this is some kind of hard to visualize. But, uh, I think I was just getting bamboozled because either in either a torus or a sphere you have periodic boundary conditions along the space directions. And I was trying to think what the what the dis discrepancy would be. If I have a torus, I have a, I have a torus, a two-dimensional torus with periodic boundaries, X and Y, right? Mm -hmm. I can put squares on that torus with, happily and then go around the boundary. I can put triangles as well. Now, take, instead of that torus uh, with periodic boundary conditions, try to wrap that thing around a sphere. Okay, I see what you're saying. You can think it's periodic. I mean, it has great circles in all directions, right? <laughs> okay. So you're on the Earth. I wouldn't call the surface of the Earth periodic, right? <laughs> it's true that you can take a great circle and come back to yourself. In fact, the tip is the first, one of the first examples of so-called uh, non-Euclidean geometry. Parallel lines on a, on a sphere, they all they don't meet, right? Yeah, so like on a, w one thing that you can think about is like that on a torus, there's two non contractible loops that you can draw. Yeah, whereas, that's another way to say it, yes. Whereas on yeah. a sphere, on a sphere, any loop that you draw, you can contract it to a point. So there's Topologically, they're also different. Okay, yeah, that's that's what I was missing. I was just thinking yeah, periodic. And, and periodic. The, other, the, other, the other thing which will actually will come in is that you can really define what you mean by intrinsic curvature. And why is this? Suppose I'm a bug on a sphere, okay? If I move north or uh, south, I definitely am curving relative to the embedded space, right? And if I go east west, I am, right? Those is called the scalar curvature. 
So you can you know on a sphere, if you think about it as a bug, that actually another way to say it is that if you go out a distance on the sphere and you take a, a circle, it is not two pi um, uh, times r. The circle gets right, the circle is smaller. So this is why you have the uh, defects in your isohedron when you try and map that whole thing out. So, so what that defect is, is that you can show that on any uh, two-dimensional manifold, the number of vertices minus edges plus faces when you triangulate or in fact do any kind of uh, tessellation. So the number of vertices, that's points, minus lines, edges, plus faces, that's a topological invariant. And that topological invariant, uh, you know, tells you that it's a sphere if it's two. If it's not two, and if it's zero, it tells you it's a torus. It actually tells you the number of handles. And so if you add this up, you'll discover, well, let's do the um, icosahedron. The icosahedron has 12 vertices. I'm not going to know. I know it has um, 20 faces. So it's 12. Yeah, it's 12 um, minus 10. Um, edges, no, no, 12, no, sorry, 12 minus 30 plus 20 is equal to 2. So, uh, yeah, uh, it's an Akasa agent. It has 12 vertices. It has 30 edges and 20 faces. Add those up, you get two. Or minus two, I guess. Two. You have two. Now, if you start adding triangles, that stays two. Because every time you add a triangle, you have to uh, you balance that out. That's called the order characteristic of the sphere. In in, uh, in triangulation for gravity, this is a thing that they do. They measure the number of them. Okay, anyway. Look, okay. So I think I'll, let me um, are yeah, there more questions on this? But no, th this geometry is very important to get straight. Um, and, and so the, my, the question is, you can ask is, why am I going to this geometry? So this is what um, I want to mention, okay. Um, so the, the, um, the point is the following, let me, go. let me see if I can, okay. Um, why am I going to the geometry? Maybe it's just because I'm crazy. So. It turns out that, so okay, you can think of spheres. This is the so called a so called cylinder. It's an R cross the, cross the sphere. And this, by the way, is what's called ADS space. The main point is that the metric, in all of these cases, if you take the flat metric, what happens is you get a, um, a metric in which you can pull out a common factor. It's sometimes called the conformal factor or while factor. So it turns out that. If you change from a flat space to a metric which has got a factor, you can drop this factor and not change the physics. The reason is subtle, but it's basically due to the fact that the conformal theory is so symmetric it doesn't notice that factor. So it means that you can solve the same conformal theory on several different geometries. You can actually take a conformal theory in flat space and solve it on a complete sphere and get the same answer. Or you can take flat space and, and have one long direction, which is called radial quantization and a sphere. And although this is more subtle, I won't talk about radial space, but it's so. So these geometries are legitimate geometries. Now, why, why would you want to do this and say like making your life difficult? The reason that you do it is the following that, um, let me see if I have this. Okay. Well, I'll have to say it. Okay. The reason to do it is the following. This geometry has a special property that when you translate um, down here, okay. let, let me, let me see. you see, what is the new time in this direction? This is R squared. So translations on this represent exponentially large changes in the 
uh, radial coordinate from the origin. So it means that when you make a lattice on this, you are getting an exponentially long um, measurement of conformal propagators. And this is, you're trying to measure things in which <laughs> correlation length is going to infinity. Of course, it's very hard to do that on a regular lattice. I mean, you make the lattice, you know, you're aggressive, so you make it uh, 100 by 100 by 100, okay? Well, you can still only go out, in fact, with periodic boundary conditions, you can only go out half of that distance before you're starting to see yourself coming around the circle. So in normal space, to try to get separations um, of something like 50 lattice spacings and see how it looks smooth at a long distance is very hard. But this, this uh, uh, parameter here now is exponential in the, um, the, the original metric. So the new time, which I've called tau, is actually an exponential dilatation. So that's the advantage number one. The advantage number two is that you don't no longer have a Hamiltonian here. You actually have exactly the operator that measures these magic numbers that I showed you from the, boot, uh, the bootstrap. They're called deltas or etas and so on, the so-called critical exponents. The critical exponents are actually the uh, eigenvalues are the propagation down this thing. So you're literally going to be, um, you're literally going to a space which allows you to directly look at the quantities which are of most interest in conformal theory, namely how does this, how do the, um, how do the fields split? And, and you are doing exponentially better job. That's the good news. The bad news is you got to put a lattice on this. So that's that's where this this whole thing came from. So we thought, oh, this is great. We're going to get exponential distances here. Must be great. And then we got, oh, well, we got to put a lattice on a sphere. So um, that's that's the next part. I'm going to try to uh, describe uh, how to put a lattice on a sphere. And at first, um, it seems easy. And then it, you get into trouble. And then we found a way to fix it. So that's the, the story. And the, and that fixing it is a um, is a good lesson in uh, in not being uh, too cavalier about them. Um, so let me uh, show you um, the, the, the basic outline, and then I, this is what I have to describe. So here again is um, is uh, my um, continuum action, and as I said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take and have a lattice in which I give these things numbers. Here's a number. So th this um, this g sits in front of these two things. So in front of this thing is going to be a g. But that's going to be a number per site. I represents the sites. Uh, these are still parameters. Uh, the field that used to be at any point x is a, is a field at each point on the on the lattice i and j. I. And then, as before, this derivative here will be made at finite differences. So this derivative is the is the um, difference between one site and another. This means a link. And then there's these magic weights. So the for, the the, the basic story is that these magic weights are understood extremely well in classical uh, physics. And as I say, it's called finite elements. And it's basically because in classical physics, all you really are doing is using this as a, as a, a mnemonic for calculating the differential equations. Does everyone know how to go from an action to equations of motion? Once, I'll slow down. See if uh, Yeah, yeah. Just minimize the action with respect to the fields. Euler and Lagrange equations. Oh, okay, right. So you see, when you write down an action in a classical problem. It's just a compact way of saying that you have a, a, some differential equations, the other Lagrange equations, which you're trying to solve. So uh, it's a common uh, um, trick to use the action, but it's also a good trick to use it to discretize the action first and then take the other Lagrange equations here. And that gives you a very good way to, um, to put differential equations onto a lattice. And indeed, um, uh, okay, every single, well, most, almost 
with all differential equations and large engineering and physics simulations of classical physics are using something like this trick. So, but for us, we want to use this action also as the as an approximation to the quantum problem with Monte Carlo. So the first step though is to solve the classical problem. And that um, can be done. Let's see, you want to take a break at quarter of, did you say? Um, trying to think of a good stopping point. Um, yeah, that, that's right, about quarter of. Yeah, okay, so let me, um, okay, so let me describe um, a, sort of the setup to this and then I'll, and then I'll um, stop and then I'll open this up so you can see it. So, so first of all, uh, I'm returning to the um, original paper just to show you, um, show you evidence that it didn't work. And this is what we're trying to cure. To know what to cure. It turns out that if you, um, okay, let me go back here. The problem is the following. If I have a sphere, then you know that the uh, solutions on the sphere are gonna be spherically symmetric. In other words, um, in the, um, if I just have, uh, harmonic modes on this thing, if they're going to be the harmonic modes of the YLM functions, the, the genre functions. And you'll know that for every mode, um, there, will be, there will be one flat mode, L equals to zero. And then there will be L equals, um, that's called S in chemistry. And then there'll be L equals one, which will have three modes, two L plus one. And then there will be, that's P, I guess. And then D, there will be five. But every time you get a mode on the sphere, the, it's actually the eigenvectors of the, um, the free problem, uh, you will know that they will come in, in uh, representations 2L plus 1. However, if you don't have that full symmetry, you have to classify the modes by the smaller symmetry of the icosahedron, and it turns out that there's only a very few uh, representations for the icosahedron, and they have to make up these things. So what happens is that at first, there's a, uh, one constant mode. It's indistinguishable from the L equal to zero mode. There's a triplet mode, which is indistinguishable from the two uh, L plus one, three um, uh, L equals one mode. There's actually a five dimensional representation, which is uh, indistinguishable from, no, I'm sorry. Um, uh, let's, I'm sorry, I'm blanking out here. Um, yeah, so eventually, okay, yeah, so, um, yeah, so in fact, actually, uh, yeah, so here's the example. We looked at the modes when we discretize it, which I'll describe, and um, before we put on any, and when we had uniform weights, here's what the mode number was for the free problem. Here's the L equal to zero mode. Here's the L equals one mode, right. And here's the L equals two mode. Now you notice these things are, look like perfect multiples. One has to be multiple with three together, five together. But this one is terribly broken. And that's what happens when you don't use the machinery of reweighting the uh, derivative terms correctly for finite elements. However, when you do finite elements, notice what happens. This is the singlet, the triplet, five, seven, so on. They look extremely good. So this is the show, this shows that the modes on the discrete spheres are actually um, looking as if it's continuous. However, we thought, well, that's great. So uh, we thought when we did the, um, where is it? Um, so when we did it with the icing model, we didn't, we ignored this totally. Where is it? Sorry. Yeah. When we did the icy model, we were not doing these weights. We were in fact just doing spins. And then we found that the um, in the case of the five modes, I'm sorry, L equals three. The first three were okay. L equals three is actually two different representations of the icosahedron. This one and this one. And this is the uh, over here is what the continuum limit is. Although our, our simulations were not terribly accurate, we just did this on a laptop. 
uh, basically. Um, you can see what's happening is there's uh, one characteristic mode that is heading to this eigenvalue and another one to this, and there's no indication that they're ever going to come together. So no matter how fine we made the lattice and the icosahedron, we were getting splitting, which showed that we were really getting representations of um, separate modes, which knew that it was on an icosahedron, okay? Um, actually, when I showed this to the bootstrap people, they said, oh, it's pretty good, you know, isn't that good enough, Richard? Why don't you just do this and put, put in a correction? <laughs> I said, that's not my game. My game is it's wrong. <laughs> I thought the, the bootstrap people would be more um, uh, adamant about that, but I guess it depends on, on your personality. So anyway, what we have here is the icosahedron is not working, even though it's not, uh, and I'm going to show you is that we uh, end up uh, reproducing this when we're on the icosahedron, and then we figure out how to get rid of this. And so that's the story. And, this, uh, and the, um, so the story takes two, um, two steps. One step is going to be to use this better, this, this, is, this is the uh, free Laplacian, it's what's replacing this. This better Laplacian in the, um, in the case of the uh, free theory, when we don't worry about quantum fluctuations and nonlinearities, that actually looks very good. And then we're going to go and do Monte Carlo, and it completely gets disrupted. So we thought we took this great step forward because we got a better spectrum, we got better classical equations. It turns out that not only did we not cure the defects of being on an icosahedron, we completely destroyed the ability to get to any kind of continuum theory. So I mean, it was very discouraging, right? You think, well, you're taking a step forward. <laughs> why isn't it getting better? And so that, that's what I'll, I will try to explain, why it doesn't get better. And that's because quantum field theory is not classical physics. So um, let me see. Um, all right, so let me just describe a little bit the geometry of how you find these, these, these sacred weights. It's actually very cute. It's, um, as I say, is a standard dumb method. So what you have to do is ask yourself, how do you, you have to ask yourself, how do you approximate this integral? That's one way to think about it. And one way you can say is that instead of letting these be continuous functions, you will define their values only on sites and then interpolate between the sites. And that's called linear finite elements. So what you do is the following. You set up a, a, uh, a basis function, which for example, is exactly one at this site and zero at all of the, the neighboring sites. So in other words, I'm gonna make the function here have this size amplified by the size of phi at that site. Now notice how this is why it's called finite elements, how, how nice it is. If I have this um, so-called piecewise linear function, I can just define a function which is one here and zero on all of the neighboring sites. And that's easy because I just make nice triangular planes. And now I have this function. When I plug it in the integral, I simply weight it by the height of the weight phi at that site. If I go over to a neighboring site here, you see that's completely independent. So each one of these pyramids, which are being put together to try to make a, um, a, a piecewise manifold, each one is only influenced by the field on each site. And that's a you know, very convenient thing. Uh, and uh, so, but then we have to figure out in this integral, what weight should be given to these edges um, when you do the integral. And that's actually a totally straightforward thing. You just substitute in this um, so-called piecewise linear form. It's actually entirely a, it's a generalization of what's called the trapezoidal rule when you do an integral. It just means that every, you're gonna have a function which is, is filled with flat planes for each triangle and all the planes will meet and have no, um, no jumps. It's not differential though, but it's, um, uh, it's continuous. And uh, when, then you just, you just go through the effort of approximating the function uh, as a function of the sites, put it in, out comes this. It's a, a machinery which is very common. It's in many papers. You can uh, make mistakes, but it's not hard. Um, it turns out that all these integrals are going to be linear integrals. And you can just do it. So um, 
so anyway, so now you can you can now start to think geometrically about the weights. And it turns out that what I was calling the weight Gx is actually you take this triangular lattice, and then there's a lattice which is called the dual lattice. This is the point which is the center of this triangle, namely its equidistance from each of the vertices. It's called the circumcenter. So if I have a triangulated lattice like this, I can now that's so called Delaney construction. No matter what the triangles are, I do it carefully. Enough, I can find the center of each. Oh, it's not a very good center here. That drawing. These are supposed to be the centers. What's supposed to be is it's supposed to be a circle that goes around here, and that circle has a point there. And so that's the so called circumcenter of a triangle. And then this polygon here is the area which I assign to this site here. And that is exactly um, what I used for this DIJ. It's uh, uh, simplex. There's a great deal of beautiful geometry in this. Uh, now, the, um, the, the, si the size of the bonds have to do with um, the ratio of the length of the separation and then an area, which is badly drawn here, associated with that. Actually, it's very badly drawn. It, it actually should go up to the circumcenter and back. So this, this thing should be up to the circumcenter, back and down. And then that, uh, that is in the numerator. It's, in other words, it's kind of the amount of area owned by this uh, bond and then divided by the length squared. So that's exactly what uh, this is. I, I call it volume because I'm thinking in, in general dimension, but in two dimensions, this is the area owned by this bond. And then this is the length separation between the two sites. So this machinery, you're just substituting this in, bang, and getting this gives you this action. And you can sort of understand it's kind of a variational principle. If you made a very nice um, linear, piecewise linear form here, it's, getting, it's doing this integral sort of well. And therefore, when you take the euler lagrange equations, you can uh, kind of imagine. By the way, the proofs in this are very difficult. The, the, the literature is, is vastly complicated. Um, but basically, you can imagine that the variation of this thing would give you euler lagrange would give you discrete versions of the differential equations. And under um, pretty complicated but, but reasonable assumptions, it will show you that the euler lagrange equations here are actually convergent the solutions of the Euler-Lagrange equations here will converge exactly to the solutions of the Euler-Lagrange equations in the continuum. Okay, so it is a very complicated machinery, uh, but nonetheless um, uh, successful. Uh, as I say, the theorems are extremely hard to to um, read because they tend to um, do it in great generality. There's not linear elements, but they're higher order ones, and they ask how many derivatives you have and what kind of Hilbert space you're in, and uh, what kind of a knock space it goes in? It's not um, for the weak, and I don't. I think from a physics point of view, we we understand the um, thing. So here's here's a little bit more of this geometry. Here I've done it better. This is the area. The, honest. the actual rule is, first of all, you divide. You divide, you divide by L12. So that's the derivative term. That's the denominator. Then you have this um, a diamond shape. Actually, you need twice that, which is a mistake I kept making in the code until I got it straight. It's actually the, the area for this, it's not so obvious, but you can show it. The area that you need to associate with this thing is actually that uh, this circumcenter um, lattice between centers times this. So it's actually twice this diamond, right? Because it's not using the one half rule to get the area of this triangle. So this is twice too big. And you could say, why is that the case? Well, it's because it's triangulated lattice and it's not a square lattice and so on. But anyway, it's true. Uh, so this is the weight. You can also um, look at the differential equation and you can see it in terms of flux. There's actually um, Stokes theorem. There's a discrete theorem. Uh, by the way, this stuff was extremely well done um, by physicists. I think some of it prior to finite elements by um, Norman Christ a, and T.D. Lee at Columbia and uh, Fred Ferenberg, uh, three people, they wrote down these equations on random lattices in flat space and got them all um, right. 
So there's uh, um, what what people have finally understood, which was not understood by them, is that you can write a uh, you can do the differential geometry down the curved space, which is a very formal thing with um, with a uh, uh, discrete. Uh, I'm sorry, with um, differential forms, and there actually is a discretized version of all these differential forms. Um, it's a little bit like this question of, of using lattices that came up in the morning talk to try to get to geometry. It's reverse. You take a thing with a clear geometry and you go to a discrete graph. And there's uh, uh, amazingly uh, elegant forms that you can show and get the same answer. Interestingly enough, you get the same answer in 2D and you get a different answer in 3D, which shows that this is not a, there's, there's more choices to be made. Um, but all of these choices, it turns out that most of the worries that people have uh, in finite elements, we're fortunately free of. First of all, we only have this positive definite second derivative form. That's much simpler than many differential equations that people write down. And the other thing is that we generally have manifolds without boundaries. And so if you look at the finite energy, the finite element literature, you will find them agonizing in, for good reasons over high derivative terms and also over how they deal with boundaries. And since we're free of those, I think um, we're in very solid relativity. So anyway, once you do that, I'll stop now. Once you do that, you look at the Laplace operator and you find this magnificent improvement. Here is what it was. If I set, if I just crudely, and I set all these to one, Right, so I, this is what the icy model did. It said that the strength in each bond was immaterial of what the bond was. So if I set this to one, I am doing the analog of our icing on the icosahedron. And, but now we have a continuous field so we can look at it. And uh, if we do that, that's what we get. We get this spectrum. And you see how utterly disastrous it is. I mean, it has three levels that are perfect. This is already bad. I don't even know what this is. This is the fourth level. Oh yeah, this is the fifth level. I guess this is at the count. This is a good exercise for the break, whether that's uh, two L plus one, I think it is. Then I think this is the next one. <laughs> this is the next one. I mean, it's ridiculous, right? It's, it's terrible, okay? And so what finite elements has done, it's done this. And in fact, um, if you take a very, very fine lattice, here's how good it is. The dispersion relation, um, should be L times L squared. And so this is a lattice, which is, this means I have broken each uh, face of the icosahedron into uh, S squared uh, subtriangles. So thousands, well, 10,000 subtriangles. And if you fit this to this correct dispersion relation, you discover that it fits this thing to a high accuracy. And in fact, the first defect is at 10 to the minus six. Uh, so this is showing that the classical, at least the free classical equations are really very, very good so long as we go to fine analysis. So I think this is a good stopping point. Uh, and I will show you that um, uh, this nice result uh, fails. <laughs> is that, is that uh, 128 triangles per face or what is S of 128 mean? Uh, yes, it actually, uh, in fact, in fact, uh, no, it's it's actually one half of that per face. The the number of um, let's see. no no exactly it's a, no it's exactly that. Okay. It's a, it's 128 squared per face. Okay. And and, and by the way, uh, Dean made that point. Even though we're running serial code, we can go up to a hugely fine lattices, right? because they're so efficient. So we, we run uh, our code at this kind of uh, resolution. And so that's one of the reasons we were able to show that it fails <laughs> until we fixed it, okay? In fact, the fix, by the way, is, um, is trying to get rid of ultraviolet um, problems. And I, I, will, I will confess that we do not have a rigorous argument for why it works as well as it does. And I think it's lacking. 
and we're trying to get higher and higher precision. You know, I'd love to get a rigorous argument, but this is actually a problem in geometry and discretization, which begs um, a careful uh, understanding, and uh, we're just in the process of doing that. So I will thank and venture that we know how to do it, uh, but I sh should basically say that there certainly are theorems on renormalizability and sort of extensions of Wil what Wilson did on a flat lattice, which, by the way, often are not proven even the flat lattice, things, but it's much harder. So let's take a break, and then I will show you um, what happens when you turn on Monte Carlo. And as I say, we'll do it in three steps. One, we'll go back to the icosahedron and show that you don't do any better than the IC model on the icosahedron. Then we'll put in the finite elements and shows that it blows up in your face. And then we'll correct the finite elements, which we call quantum finite elements, and are able to uh, solve two problems to reasonable accuracy where we know the answer and probably is correct. Thank so you, Dr. Brown. Paul, Paul, do you want us to um, log into the second link or to just stay on this one? Yeah, let's, let's go ahead and log into the second link. And the reason we should do that is that way, whenever we do the next recording, they'll be uh, sorted. And so I can end this recording, and then that way, when I post, you know, these lectures I should, later, I should, I should jump out of this. Thing. Yeah. All right. Great. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Brown. Thanks a lot. I hope uh, this was uh, informative. It's uh, really hard to not look into your face and see what exactly what I'm doing. Awesome. That's the icing model, not very well written, right? I actually think writing is a good idea. Now it turns out that you know there are ways. This is my iPhone turned into a camera, so I found a good way to do this. I can also do um, you know iPads and stuff, but I find that shifting back and forth is better to use a pen. Okay. But now I need to go back to my slides. Start. Oh, what's this sound? Oh, I'm not. I'm not video. Actually, you know, all of these things are um, slightly different, of course. Why should they be the same? And I've gotten pretty used to Zoom, but less used to this. What? Um, now I need to get the actual note. Too big. Oh, it's too big. I don't play. Oh, I see. Is that, can you see that? Hello? Yeah. The only thing is, I can't see anything else. It's, it's, um, it's disturbing the rest of my screen. No, that's all right. Uh, but is that good? It, it's, it's fantastic to me. Is that good to you? Yes, just as clear as last time. Oh, this is clear. Okay, so anyway, uh, hello, are people here? Can I'll speak in one at once? Yeah, Dr. Brower, people just have to. Hello. Uh, yeah, sorry, <laughs> no, yeah, no, it, yeah every, everyone is muted, um, is everyone the reason they're not. I see. Well, you know, this is a uh, late afternoon. Yeah, I have to give you. By the way, who are people? Uh, are you guys coming in from uh, the West Coast? So it's a reasonable time? Some of you? Yeah. Where are you from? Tell me, tell me who you are a little bit. Uh, well, I'm in Colorado. My name's Andrew. What is, and what is your field? What is your interest? I do condensed matter physics. All right. This is all condensed matter physics in this class. Actually, not in this class. It really is condensed matter physics. Oh, perfect. Um, 
The icing model in five fourth theory is everybody's favorite toy to learn all of the tricks of the trade, particularly for Monte Carlo. Because you know, once you can do it for one model, then the rest uh, is um, details, right? So I um, mean, it, it's a very good thing. You can write a, you can write yourself a code. Actually, um, Dean showed you how to even do it in parallel, which is even harder. But the um, cluster algorithm, by the way, is an amazingly successful algorithm. It's it's the dream algorithm that people hope that they could find in every field theory. Unfortunately, it is uh, restricted to a class of field theories, slightly growing class. The cluster algorithm is so rapid. What we do when we I'll show you the simulations. We get, I'm not kidding, millions of independent configurations to analyze. And we do them with what's called improved estimators. And so we are capable of getting uh, exponents and things out to four or five decimal places. So that's why we're hopeful that we can eventually um, compare with the bootstrap, which claims to get many decimal places. If we get a different answer, it shows that one or the other of us are wrong, which is perfectly possible. We're both making assumptions. Uh, but if you get agreed, it's a high um, uh, a high confidence uh, vote for both methods, which is what I think will happen. But we'll see. Okay, so anyway, here here's our here's our first step. We can take the action. We know what it is in a classical field theory. In this case, by fourth, we try to put it on a lattice of um, triangles. The general word for this is called this general name for this is called a simplicial lattice. It can be done in any dimension. In two dimensions, we only have curvature in two dimensions in this case. When you're in higher dimensions, three dimensions, instead of filling the space with triangles, you fill them with tetrahedrons. Four points define a tetrahedron uniquely. In four dimensions, it's whatever the next thing beyond a tetrahedron is. I don't know if people got a name, but they're all called simplices. Simplices are incredibly useful for this sort of discrete differential geometry. Every simplex lattice has simplex lattice has a has a dual lattice made out of circumcenters. There is a standard definition of what is basically an epsilon symbol in field theory that goes from a tensor to a dual tensor, or a form to a, a dual form. There is a, a definition of the Laplacian, the so-called Atomic Laplacian. I'm just trying to tell you this is not arbitrary. There's a beautiful X um, uh, statement of these lattices. And by the way, everything that everybody's done on a square lattice is a special case of this. You can write the square lattice Lagrangian down and think of it as a triangulation. I should show you on this piece of paper, but I haven't done it. If you take a square lattice and you write down the rules that I've given you, and on every square you put a diagonal in, and you think that you're doing it on a triangular lattice and you apply these rules, you'll get exactly the triangular uh, discretization. So actually, everybody has been using this mechanism. They've just been using it in a case which is simpler. Okay, so I I, I really believe that this is um, a very strong formalism for dealing with curved spaces, and it's not just an example. So that's part of the part of the reason we're looking at this. If we thought it was only could solve one problem, we'd say okay, let's solve one. So anyway, so let's let's see what happens when we use this kind of lattice. As I said before, first of all, it gives you the spectrum of the Laplace operator beautifully below the cutoff. Um, and then, well, here's here's just the sort of um, formalism to, for those people who like math, and it's not, it's not, um, it's not crazy. Uh, in, you know, in a geometry, this thing called an exterior derivative, the exterior derivative of a form and a volume, we can return, I'm sorry, uh, the exterior derivative on a surface, and let's this wrong. This has got to be wrong. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, the exterior derivative on a volume becomes Stokes' theorem uh, over the surface. There is this integration by parts, essentially, from the exterior derivative to the dual. This is d sub d. There is a statement of the size of the elements. I didn't go through this carefully, but these are the simplices of different dimension, points, lines, volumes, etc. This is the dual. This makes an area. This is the rule. The the um, cent the use of circumcenters means that there's an orthogonality. Um, I keep telling my, my colleagues, we're not just doing something arbitrary. This is a very elegant way to make sure we get the right manifold and the right differential operators. I think it's correct and rigorous. All right, that all sounds good. So, and so it, it, look, it didn't work. 
So, of course, like any um, sensible uh, uh, physicist, when you can't solve the problem you started with, you make a simpler problem, right? So we started with this sphere, which is dragged down a cylinder. So it's R times a, a sphere as a topology. Well, of course, we don't need the R. We could just look at a sphere. And instead of having a three-dimensional lattice, we would have a two-dimensional lattice. So, and it would have most of the difficulties because our difficulties are clearly with the tessellation of the sphere, the triangulation of the sphere. Once we get the sphere, we just march down uh, um, by uniform uh, segments down R. So really the only complexity in this lattice is on the sphere. So we decided, ha, ah, we, we uh, gave up. <laughs> we said, wait up, can't get it to work. Let's do the sphere. Now, the sphere is actually a well-defined projection from the plane. It's not called radial quantization. It's called the Riemann sphere. Or the, or the um, what is it called? Riemann sphere? I guess the Riemann projection, I guess. So what it does, it's a way to complete the sphere. You take a sphere, I guess, can you see this, this diagram? It's not, it's kind of messy. You take a sphere and you put it on the plane. And then you draw a line from the North Pole and it hits the sphere and then it hits the plane. And that is a mapping of all points on the sphere, including infinity. That's the point. It completes the plane. It puts the in plane, the entire plane, it folds up on a sphere. Now, it's, of course, a very strange mapping, but again, the magic of conformal limits is that at that exact point, the theory is completely transferable exactly from the plane to the sphere. It's not, oh, shoot. Ah, ah. I think it's probably a telemarketer in my iPhone. Okay, so anyway, it turns out that because of the, Increased symmetry at the conformal point because there's this uh, translate uh, because you have a um, uh, scale symmetry and these other symmetries. You can show that every single thing you measure on the plane has a simple rule to transfer it exactly to the same uh, measurement on the sphere, one to one. And so you can solve the thing on the sphere and get all of the exact answers that are known from the exact two dimensional Lyson model. And you have another advantage even here, is that the sphere represents the entire infinite plane. You are not doing this on a finite. You are using the infinite limit of the toroidal geometry and mapping the entire thing onto a sphere. Okay, so this is already, um, in fact, even if we hadn't done radial quantization, this is a, um, a good thing to do. We can do an infinite volume in this space by this mapping, okay? and um, I mean, if anyone who's done lattice gaze theory things and have, have suffered over the fact that they have to have finite volume. Now, it's not true except for the exact conformal limit. So away from that, it's just a different finite volume. It's not, not a bad one, by the way. It may well be useful. So I actually think spherical um, lattices will come in eventually and be used in, in places where it hasn't been used. So now, okay. So uh, well, this is actually kind of a little bit backwards stuff. I, I know, because this is truth in the science. I showed you how beautiful the spectrum was. I want to show you that, of course, no spectrum is good when you go straight up to the highest modes that are at the cutoff. This, by the way, is what people do on a hypercubic lattice. So they all look and say, oh, look how beautiful the spectrum is. It should be, it should be uh, uh, m squared plus p squared. It should be just uh, the, uh, the relativistic spectrum. It should be just this parabola. And it gets ragged like here. Now, nobody ever looks up there. They say, oh, I don't care about it. I just want to have the place where I'm, I have very smooth rolling fields across the lattice. And this is what it is on our lattice. Actually, to be honest, I think our lattice is better than most of the hypercubic lattices. Look at this standard hypercubic lattice. Has a, halfway through the spectrum, it's hopeless. Halfway through the spectrum, it's not bad. So. We are doing a very good job at the classical level. This is just a, another kudo for this. Okay, so now what happened? What happened when we tried to simulate this on the sphere is we looked at this, uh, the value of, uh, to go to the condensed matter, we can think of phi as the magnetization. So we're looking at magnetization squared. So in, in, a, in a magnet, this would be magnetization. 
So we're looking at this around the sphere. And what we found is that when we average the sphere, this is in this beautiful finite element lattice, nice circle symmetry. We found that the magnitude of the square of the magnetization had this nice funny pattern. And it's not accidental that you start to see these hot spots where the icosahedron uh, had its poles, where it had its uh, original vert vertices, right? So this is clearly not rotationally invariant. So what's going on here? I mean, this is actually a long time to speak up. What's going on? I mean, we've got this beautiful, uh, smooth uh, dispersion, uh, sorry, here, dispersion relation for the Gaussian theory. So, you know, in long distances, this is the first part of this is a thing that represents some modes uh, that are long distance. There's, this is the constant mode. This is the one with one uh, vibration, two vibrations, and so on. And nonetheless, when we looked at the quantum average, this thing clearly is not at the long distance right at all. I mean, look at this is a this is like if you do a harmonic analysis of this, you know, you're doing this on the Earth or something. This is like an L. Actually, I think it's about an L equals five state. It's hugely bad. It's hugely bad where this spectrum is good. It's right here, down here at these low modes. This spectrum is just hopeless. So what is happening? Actually, it's very funny. I was, I was, well, we almost got this figured out, and, and I was, as usual, uh, trying to explain things that I didn't understand to Martin Luther, who said very quick, and he said, "What about ultraviolet divergences?" And I said, "Oh, damn it! Of course, that's what it is." <laughs> it only took one suggestion. Now, so what's happening is the following: when you write a, a Feynman diagram. The Feynman diagram has loops. Here's a loop. Oops, there is a loop. And this Feynman diagram is an integral over the momentum flowing around this. But it's not a perfect integral because the momentum modes are cut off. We have a lattice, and the maximum momentum is pi over a. This is the thing. You can't get a perfect thing. It's the same reason that the spectrum, the spectrum has low momenta and then it gets cut off. In fact, here there's a maximum momentum. And they're also terrible, right? So the problem is that this thing has contributions from maximum momentum. Why does it bother you? In a regular lattice, no matter where you put this point for the Feynman diagram, it has a uniform deformation. You can put the point on one lattice site, and you can translate the next, the next, the next. And what you find is this thing is fine. It's sure it's some kind of terrible constant. But it doesn't depend on X because no matter what site, you have to put these in sites, no matter what site I'm in, I get the same answer. But we have a slightly irregular lattice. And exactly when these momenta get high, this thing starts to diverge. It actually has a logarithmic divergence. And that's exactly when the spectrum starts to get ragged. So unfortunately, field theories, this is the reason that renormalization is so necessary. As you go to higher and higher frequencies, which are the same as higher energies, you have, you have to get rid of the so-called ultraviolet divergence. And the lattice, you never have it. It just hits the maximum allowed in the uh, wave vectors on the lattice. But if the lattice is uniform, it hits it universe, uniformly every place. And so Wilson said, OK, fine. We just added a constant. We, we tune it to the critical surface. Everything's fine. But here it's not fine because this thing knows it's measuring the it's measuring the slight deformation of these triangles. Even though you couldn't see them very easily with the eye, this thing is a fine tool of measurement of the defects on our lattice. It's, it's, it's designed to do that. In fact, if you were an experimentalist, you would say, what order primer would I define in order to find the defects in the lattice? And they would just tell you this order primer. They say that's obviously magnetization squared close to the thing. So this depends on position. Now, so the question is, can we do anything about that? Well, it turns out, fortunately, and this is not entirely obvious, if you look at what this dependence is, it's actually the it's a propagator. You have to you have to solve you have to solve for the, the Feynman diagram that propagates around here through the lattice. Like that, 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 that perfect circle course goes everywhere, it comes back. So you can do that. And that's called a, a propagator. And in our case, it's um, we, we have it. We can define it. And what we discover is, sure enough, 
it has a logarithmic divergence when the lattice spacing goes to zero. But notice, I've assumed that the lattice spacing is slightly different on every site because there really is not a uniform lattice spacing. If I look at the length of the links, they vary slightly as they go across the lattice. So I put this in as a, as a, a way to think about it, okay? Now, the interesting thing though, is that if I multiply this by a uniform lattice spacing A and divide by it, all I do is get the added term. And this thing never gets big. This is order one. Even the lattice spacing at each point varies. It only varies by you know a few percent, well, I don't know, ten percent, twenty percent. But this ratio is a is a perfectly good constant. So we get the right divergence here. This is the right logarithmic divergence that the continuum wants to have, independent of position. So the major divergence is independent of position. It is not a problem with that. It's a problem with this additive constant where it knows the cutoff is slightly different than a mean cutoff. So we can define a mean cutoff, the average length of the lattice links relative to the link. I should have put an I of J here. I can think of this thing as the bottom. So we, only, we can calculate this constant. So what we do is we, we subtract this, we average, we average this thing so this cancels, and then we subtract this and the add it to the, well, this is just to show you how to do it. And we add it to it. And then what happened, and I'll show you this a little bit when I go back to radio quantization. What happened is that once we did this correction, then we could find the critical point. Now, this is a technical issue. Which I'm going to, um, but let, me, let me just, um, okay. Um, let me go forward. I'm going to fly. I'm going to do the two the next one quickly. Yeah, you can define uh, this. This m is is um, the sum over phi x. It's a magne the total magnetization of the dense particles. There is a combination which is used called the Binder cumulant. And if you measure the fourth power of the magnetization over the average, is the average. Over, over the uh, ensembles that give you the quantum fluctuations or the thermal fluctuations. This is the average of squared. So this is homogeneous, but this is the fourth moment and this is the second moment squared. And you can convince yourself that this object, when it works, if you tune exactly to the critical surface, this is the parameter that proves, you tune to the critical surface, you actually get this to stabilize at a, at a known number here. If you're on one side, what happens is that, suppose that this thing becomes a huge constant. Well, this is a huge constant, and this is a huge constant. Then this is, uh, these are equal, and you get two minus two thirds, one minus two thirds times two thirds, and the thing goes to zero. So if you're on one side of the tuning, it goes to zero. And if you go on the other side, it goes to infinity. So this represents a very sensitive way to measure whether you are actually hitting the critical surface, okay? So that's what we did. I'll go back to the tuning case for case where we did the formula. So we found that we could tune to the critical surface. And notice we had to tune very accurately. This is this um, uh, uh, tachyonic mass. Notice that we know we can tune it to what's somewhere between red and red and blue, right? So we know it to one, two, three, four, five, maybe a little bit of six, six decimal places. So we can find the critical surface as we go to finer and finer lattice extremely accurately. It turns out because the icing model in 2D is exactly soluble, we actually know analytically by looking at unsolved solution. Yeah, this ensemble. We can actually know what this is. This is the theoretical value, and this is the value that we got on our lattice, which is one, two, three, four, five decimal. No, this is okay. Four decimal places. So the four decimal places, it's equal to the known theoretical value. Um, by the way, um, yeah. By the way, uh, uh, Joel asked me how how many triangles we have. This is. Um, 
This is uh, 20 times 800 square triangles. Um, so 10 to the seven or something triangles, okay? Oh, here's the sites. It's six, six million sites per, uh, on this view. So cluster algorithms are so fantastic that we can actually do it with six million sites, okay? So these are really very accurate answers. And so we did the sphere and we found out that indeed it was getting rid of this term here, which actually uh, helped the thing along. Uh, so, um, and then we could calculate, now this is just, uh, oh, here's the, here's the dimension of the time. Okay. Um, then this is just a statement that we know the answer and we have the math to find out what the correlation functions are. So we measure the correlation functions. Here's the analytic one is this line here. Here's our, our lattice correlation function. By the way, here's the analytic one, mathematic to the rescue. Uh, the IC model has such beautiful, uh, the exponent, by the way, this exponent, this is eta, and this is the one, this is what conformal field this uses, the scaling dimension of phi. This is what uh, was defined by condensed matter physics long ago. This is known to be exactly one eighth. Um, and uh, here are the moments, <laughs> okay, mathematical field. Uh, here's actually um, a, a four-point function. This is a map of the four-point function. It's a two-variable map uh, of variables. It's, again, exactly known. Here's the um, uh, actual calculations. Let's see. So this thing is known to be exactly one. Decimal places. By the way, this is just a serial code. It's not a it's not a high performance computing. This thing is known to be a quarter and you get it close. This is what's called the central charge, which is known to be a half, and you get it to the percent uh, So on. So we convinced ourselves that we can solve the problem we started with. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna transfer back to the uh, cylinder, which is the original problem we started with. And we haven't yet got this to as high accuracy um, for two reasons. One is we discovered that there was one more uh, gotcha that we had to deal with. And I'd like to explain that because it shows how uh, geometry does manage. But otherwise, it was really the same uh, methodology. And uh, we also, a three dimensional problem is a bigger lattice. So we're in the process of writing better code. It might be GPU code, although. I think the GPU code, even in spite of uh, Dean's cleverness, is still hard. We'll probably write good threaded code, uh, maybe MPI code, but certainly something like what you all described for MPI plus threads will uh, be more than enough for this problem. So what we're doing, just to remind you, here's the flat space, three dimensions. Here's the transformation to the lattice, again, Maybe a little clearer. This in radial coordinates, right? This is just um, dr. The dr is, is the r over log r squared. So that would be r squared. If this were two dimensions, this would be dr squared r d theta squared. So this is just a flat metric. We are not doing that. We are changing the geometry. And what we do is we drop this term. So our cylinder has a fixed radius and a flat direction down the cylinder. So although this seems very harmless, this is the big change. This is just a change in coordinates. I take the regular coordinate distances, the delta squared, the um, Pythagorean rule in flat space. I go from the origin out to R. This is a real thing from the origin out. And then at each circle around the origin, but you know, I'm gonna, since I set this all up, I'm going to take the privilege uh, of um, once drawing on a pad of paper since I got one. It's still helpful. Let's see if I can do this without totally in a rush. I don't know if the pad is fit, of course. Pad share. Let me share it again. I think it's good. 
you see my piece of paper? Can you? Yes. You can. All right. Well, I actually succeeded in doing. Oops. I succeeded in setting this up, so I have to use it. As a matter of fact, I set it up. <laughs> I got it going. As soon as I started to um, to lecture, I discovered that my iPhone had battery had gone dead, so I had to try and charge it up, and I couldn't use it. Oh, wait a minute! You can't see it. In fact, it's off. It's not. It's not maybe I'm. Maybe I'm going to be bamboozled again. I hope not. Not active. Oh, yes, it is. Okay, good. It doesn't have great bandwidth. I got to figure it out. Okay, see that? I start off with a flat plane like this, right? And this is, say, X is Y. In radial quantization, we take a direction here of length R. And if we're in two dimensions, this is theta. And the lengths. Of course, the infinitesimal is dx plus dy squared, right? But it is also equal to dr squared, and then the size of the circle, r squared d theta squared. Oops, oops, right? Oh, it's, it's, it's off the screen. Right? So the trick is very simple you write r squared out front and that gets rid of the change in radius of the circle and then you write the log r over dr squared or d, d log r squared so the point is the new metric is d log r squared plus d theta squared that's the d radial coordinate. You notice that the circles do not change their size. Okay? Real radial coordinates, as you go out, the circle gets bigger and bigger. But in radial quantization, you use log r as the distance out, and you use theta as the angle, which is a fixed circle of radius one. Okay? So that seems um, mild do, but that's, that means that the manifold has changed. Now, in this case, the manifold is actually turned into a flat space because it's flat in R, the log R, and it's flat in theta. But when you go to two dimensions, this has to be the two dimensional uh, thing, which has got a, um, what, I don't know, a D theta squared sine pi or something. You're trying to steer up the coordinates. So, in two, when you have a one plus two, all hell breaks loose. And in fact, uh, this was known a long time ago that if you only had two dimensions, radial quantization is used all the time in string theory. They hadn't even noticed it. They didn't even call it that most of the time. But when you get higher dimensions, it's it's a problem. And so, but it's dropping that R squared. Oops, I just lost my name. It's dropping. It's just dropping this factor of R squared, which makes this thing higher dimensions a completely different problem. Okay, so. Succeeded in using that once. Thanks. So. I had to do it once because. Dr. Barr, you muted yourself. We think. Maybe accidentally. Maybe on purpose. Oh, it's definitely no, accidental. No, it's accidental. <laughs> um, I'm not known for trying to mute. Um, but I also am not now finding how to share the screen again. It just no, the screen I want. It doesn't tell me it's been one. See my uh, oh, yes, you did. Yep. Oh, good. All right. So, in future, I'm going to have to figure out how to go back and forth between the uh, camera and the other more quickly. I haven't succeeded in doing this. At least it's working on this so anyway, um, we go now forward. Yeah. So anyway, the point is the following. I'm now going to go back to the problem that we actually tried to do. And there's one new thing that happens, which we, um, 
were not aware of how important it was. And that is that remarkably, wait, I'll see here. Remarkably, when you go to higher dimensions, I wrote down this term, I wrote down this last term, and I wrote down this term. But there's an extra term due to the geometry, which is called the Ricci scalar. This is actually seeing the curvature of the sphere at the at the cross sections of the cylinder. It's called x in general. This would be a function of x, but we have actually constant curvature, so it's just a constant. So the funny thing about it is this is a constant. So you say, who cares? It just could be lumped into this constant, and it's and that's true at a classical level. <laughs> The lesson of this thing is beware that classical physics is not quantum physics. A squared term is a five squared term. If this is a constant, which it is, then who cares? We'll just redefine the mass. So let me go back and tell you what the actual constant is. It turns out that this constant has a, I'll have to explain to you where this comes from, but it has a constant which depends on dimension. Now notice that when dimension is two, namely the sphere case that we first did, this is zero. Luckily, we went back to a sphere where this term just didn't occur. The funny thing about it is this constant depends on the fact, even though the curvature is only on the sphere, the constant T is still not zero because it knows that the space is three dimensional. And the actual curvature term is this. And when you put it in, and we are sort of aware of this thing, it means that the spectrum that I've been bragging about, that we get L times L plus one, actually with the Ricci term and no mass, it's actually L plus a half squared. So this term exactly adds to this one quarter. Now, I, we actually kept thinking about this because it seemed logical. If you have a wave on a closed space, like a sphere, Remember, you should, it should never be able to have a flat uh, mode, which is just goes out to infinity. At L equal to zero, it should be a gap, it's so called a gap, should occur. So it really makes sense that if you're on a compact space, that you should have this one quarter. And indeed, we noticed that when we did finite elements for the Dirac equation, the spectrum was L plus a half. So this is my um, homework exercise for Joel. He's promised to solve this, I think we'll do it this weekend. Um, it's interesting because the Dirac equation, when we did finite elements, actually knew that the spectrum was L plus a half. And notice that this is the square of this. And in general, there is this sort of uh, rule in, in the Dirac equation that if you do it carefully enough, the square of the Dirac equation is the equation for the Laplacian of the, of the um, scalar. And indeed, in supersymmetry, you use this. You use the fact that the Dirac equation and the scalar are very closely related. So I'm not sure why this has to be. The trouble with this argument, by the way, is this argument says it should be there even when you're in two dimensions when this is zero. So there's something loose, some loose screw in my argument. But anyway, it's, it's, it's natural. And we actually kept putting that in there. To, now, it, all it does, all it does is seems to do something that's not very important. We put this constant here, uh, and then it brings in some constant. And eventually, we have some bare mass, which we have to tune. And as I said, we can actually absorb this term into this. So why is it important? So that, that's where the story gets uh, very um, interesting. And by the way, I mean, we didn't understand this theoretically until we started to see it numerically. So we shouldn't um... So anyway, so this is our lattice action. Now, we have this extra term. Since we weren't far enough, and actually, well, the way we did the right thing, we actually dropped this term when we did the money graph operation. And in fact, you can even show that because of this a squared term here and this phi, that this thing actually vanishes as a goes to zero. So we didn't make a mistake. Uh, by the way, the time axis and the, and the space axis, we set this to one. So we didn't make a mistake. We actually used this kinetic term. We used this time term with a equals a, a t. We use these things. And we just drop this from our simulation. And it turns out that that's correct. But now we had to do the same thing we did in two dimensions. We had to get rid of uh, the distance defects 
But there are two diagrams that diverge in, in two dimensions. There's a one loop diagram, which we already had, and then there's these two loop diagrams, much the same um, technology. We took the, we found out how it depended on X. We found out this depended on X and Y. We subtracted the worst part of it and added it back into the Lagrangian. So, uh, okay, this is just, it's not, so what happened? So we're sort of, this is sort of repeating the thing. So we go to the uh, three-dimensional problem. So first of all, we check our old calculation. We just, instead of being badly squashed. <laughs> all right, oh, I don't know, this not squashed. Anyway, um, we just tessellated the ice cost sahedron without finite elements. We just set every single term to unity. And again, what we found was we found a very good critical theory, just like the icing model, but this is now for 5 4 theory of our paper. We could look at the bit of cumulant, we could easily tune it to a known, uh, well, I can't, the value here is not known, so you have to compute it. Uh, but we could see that there's a well defined critical surface. Now we added the finite elements that gave us a perfect set of oil Lagrange equations, perfect classical physics. And we tried to find the critical surface and we couldn't find it. No matter far, how high, far we went down here, eventually the thing will go back up. Actually, it starts to oscillate. We haven't shown it all here. But no matter where we tried to find the critical surface, you have to find some place that has a bullseye tuning right straight to here. This is the lattice spacing, one of the lattice spacing. We could find no critical surface when we did find it out. So our cure, made the disease worse. This is a critical theory. This is not a critical theory. Then we added these counter terms, and sure enough, we were able to tune directly. So quantum fine analysis with counter terms does have a critical theory. Then we went back and checked the, um, the same uh, issue um, that we did before. What's going on? I can't. I can't. Okay. So then we actually also looked at this question of spherical symmetry. And th this again was the, um, these are the two irreduced representations on the icosahedron. When we had icosahedral CFT, these two different representations, clearly as we went to a finer and finer lattice, they never approach each other. Then we looked at it after the counter terms are added. And sure enough, they're within statistics, they are becoming uh, this is the L equals three mode. It's perfectly okay. Everything's working fine. It's very, very proud of itself. So and then we said, well, we'll have to do some non trivial calculation. We have to calculate this exponent. This is a, a, one of the exponents so, uh, that we define. So we decided to look at the exponent. <clears throat> so we do it in finer and finer lattice here and here and here. We didn't have this curve to guide us. We draw a straight line here. It hits here. What was that? The answer is known. The answer is known to be 0 0.518. Oh, I guess it's well, the legend doesn't. This legend, this legend looks wrong, doesn't it? Paper. This is from the paper, which is not yet on the app. So. But the, this is supposed to be the right answer. Does that look like maybe it does? Yeah, it's so big. Yeah, right. This could be 0.158. Sure, it could be. This is up here. This is all the way down there. Right. So this is the continuum value. So what's happening here is that we're not getting a very clean extrapolation on measuring this lowest energy state. This is really the easiest thing to do. This is the first um, expected mode above this. And it's also not heading, it's a little bit better. This one is this one is looking okay. So the higher modes are looking okay, but this lowest mode is just complete. I mean, by the way, the errors on these points you can't see. We have such good accuracy that the errors here are about 10 to the minus three. They're tiny. They're, they're probably even smaller than that, 10 to the minus four. So the reason that we fit these curves is we said, well, okay, we'll just try fitting it to some crazy power. So usually you would just have a linear term. We'll fit it to some crazy power. Eventually, we found this crazy thing was about this number. We started to think. 
What about this reaching term that we just left off? So we dropped, we dropped this term. Now it turns out that um, it, in order to scale this thing, it needs a factor of AQ. So this, this thing now has a scaling behavior. This is an, all of the fields represent the various exponents that you see in condensed matter. Uh, so every field represents an operator, every operator measures an exponent. So it's just a, a, it's the same problem, just with a different language, unfortunately. Language. So it turns out that we know the scaling property of this thing. And we know that the scaling of this thing is about 1.4, 1 1.41. 1 .41. And we have to take out the one to make this a cube. And in no, and, and in no uncertain terms, we discovered that this thing that we fit here, this is not the fit, this is assuming it, the, the, this value that we fit on this curve was almost entirely equal to what this term is that we left out. The funny thing about it is that, strictly speaking, it is a term that's going to zero. So why is it, why is it bad? You see, if you have a fractional power with A, take the derivative of this curve as a function of A. So you take the derivative of a to the point four, the derivative means that it's equal to one over a to the point six, or point five nine. That means that the derivative of this curve is infinite slope here. So if you have a term that you've left off of your Lagrangian, even if it's technically correct, you're going to have a very hard time figuring out what the answer is if you've got to meet this curve at an infinite slope. And that's what's happening. So we actually sat on this data for a year probably, trying to figure out what's going on until we became aware that no, it probably, we should, even though it was technically correct, it was technically okay to drop this term or this term in the effective lattice action. It gives us the right theory. It just gives us the right theory very slowly. And it, for the uh, this exponent is disastrously slowly. It exponented it as an infinite slope trying to get to the right answer. So is this okay? So then we check and we say, all right, this term is small. So we didn't redo the calculation. We just introduced this as a perturbation on the calculation. So you do a perturbation calculation. All of these things are more or less standard lattice stuff. What, by the way, not inventing any lattice methods. This is some, um, these are very common. So you can actually uh, write a, um, a, what's called a form factor in, in most uh, lattice things. You can take the matrix element of this term that we dropped in the state that we're trying to measure and find out how much it shifts it. And this is a known parameter. It's not a variable. This is given by the gods of Riemann geometry. And these points here are the data. And just that in this term, this green point is the prediction perturbative, right? So this is not a fit. This is a statement of the answer. So you see what's happening? But out here, there's some extra corrections. It's probably a linear term somewhere. But it goes right there. And so it's going right up to it. And then we also um, decided to do a very short case. We threw this term back into the action and redid the Monte Carlo. And obviously, if you're going to put it in perturbatively, you might as well just throw it into the thing and, and really do it with it there. And here's the new values. In fact, here are the new values. Okay. So a very short calculation, I mean, this was done on a you know, two days or something. These are the values. So instead of having, let's, let's look here, let's, for example, uh, uh, point, the third point here, which I think is, um, yeah, let's look at this point. Yeah, this point here is this point here. So this point here had an error of, um, I don't know, 10 or something? Between uh, 337 and what should be um, 
uh, 5.1. So this thing had like a 30% error. It added it back in, and it has like a 0.01%. Uh, I'm sorry, a 0.1% error. And so we haven't done this very accurately, but clearly putting this term back in is going to save the day for getting accurate answers. So we learned something. Actually, interestingly enough, we didn't really understand the theory until we saw it numerically. So this shows you that sometimes uh, the computer is smarter than you are, which is good. And once we do this, now we're set up to do higher form functions. How do you deploy higher form functions? You take input one field on one side. This should be a sphere. I can't draw spheres yet. Yeah. You put one field on one part of the sphere, another on another. And think of this as time. So time goes from left right to left. So you start off with these two states, you propagate, you put it here. Um, this shows you that there's an amplitude. You start with two fields, it propagates in uh, it propagates in, in time. This is the delimitation operator that tells you the state, the eigenvalues. This is some factors that we um, normalize by. Uh, so we can go, we can do this computation, and the result is that we can get. Eventually, um, we can get a very good, I think, calculation of most of the numbers that the bootstrap gives us. Now, if we agree, then everybody will say that they're right and we're right. If they don't agree, we have to really um, think hard. The bootstrap makes some very interesting assumptions, which they're very aware, which are not rigorous. Uh, they have rigorous inequalities. And then they make some minimization principles for central charge. We have uh, arguments which are rigorous up to a point, classically, that we're making some assumptions about how we can introduce quantum compressions. So we could both be wrong, and we could both be right. If we agree, then it's good evidence that we're both right. If we're different, <laughs> then there will be an argument. Uh, although these exponents have been done by so many methods that maybe eventually, um, we can't both be right. But anyway, this is the reason that we're doing this case um, that we want to test. So anyway, so this is the preprint that was going to be on the web. Um, so I, I, let me stop for questions here. So this is uh, finally doing the problem that was done, in, that we started in 2013. And uh, the claim is that uh, when, we, when we redo the calculation with this term, I'm of no trouble getting uh, this thing to four or five decimal places. There will be no trouble statistically. Uh, that doesn't mean that it's going to work. In fact, it will be a huge test of whether we're actually making some subtle mistake at this point. So, do we have questions? Let me see if there's anything in the uh, in the chat. If I can find the chat. Where is the chat? Find it, Dr. Brower. I found the chat, but I didn't find any chattery. Come on, you got to be talking talkative at this time late in night. I, I have a request. Oh, Could you give a very high level overview of what you did um, okay. on the last thing? Because I did the bad thing where I got confused and I didn't ask a question soon enough, and then it was yeah, too late. You after promised that. to ask a question. I was counting on you, you know? By the way, what is your name? Who am I talking to? Uh, Nick. Nick. And you are. And RPI or what? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Working with Joel? Yep. Yes. Oh yeah, I don't know if you heard last thing? Oh, I think um yeah, I think Joel's told me that you're a student with Joel, is that correct? Am I getting you right? Oh yeah, it's uh it's on your praises. I hope um we can oh, uh, uh, Joel Joel has promised to help me on some of the harder problems here. So maybe um maybe you're the one to um uh, help. Um, so, what is your question? You want a high level view, okay? It, like, not a not high level is in detail, as in like a very general overview because I right, right. got so, thrown off and didn't recover. No, 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 it's not. I understand. Look, we write down this action as an integral over a, a, a single field. We could, uh, more complicated actions have more fields, right? So, we have a single field, pi of x, and we know how to write down the action. 
and put it onto a spherical manifold. That's the standard. You change coordinates, you write the metric, and it's it's very simple. So when you when you say put it on a spherical manifold, do you you just mean you're you're consider you're phrasing everything in terms of the coordinates of the sphere? I, I just mean that I write down this equation. The first equation here. For for a sphere. It's like you know, the metric goes like a sphere. Okay. Right. So, so in, in a sphere, this is going to be just uh, four over r squared, a constant. Uh, this is these are just the fields. Uh, this uh, squared of g for a uh, sphere is um, well, it depends on coordinates. You see, the whole whole beauty of this uh, formalism is it's true of any coordinates, right? So, if you wrote this thing as um, t d phi d cosine theta, the standard coordinates, right? And then this thing would be it's x of um, cosine theta. I should have written it down, okay? So, you know, there's a few, if you use spherical coordinates theta and phi on the sphere, the standard things you use for the genre functions, then you'll have um, some cosines sitting around. Okay, okay? sure, sure. And the, where did the Ricci term come from? Was that, because that wasn't present in like the first That's, slide. That, that is a tricky thing of, that is not a um, elementary thing. You can look up in GR books, um, uh, let's see, what's the one, Mandel? The statement is the following, and it's quite, it's quite subtle. If you start in flat space with this um, kinetic term and no masses, then this is a, what's called free conformal theory. There's no mass. And you just have, you, you just strike these all out, you strike everything out, and you just write dv, and you just have this kinetic term, okay? That is called a free conformal theory. Then there is a condition of conformality for a classical free theory when you change from one manifold to the other. And okay. You go in our book, and it says you must have this reach each term or to you violating conformality. Okay. As I say, I, 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 think the, um, well. I think the intuitive yeah, the intuitive thing I think is exactly this um, statement here that after all, if you start putting something on a sphere, you should have a um, you should modes on the sphere get trapped. Okay. So I think the one way to say it is that the modes that um, uh, that you have in a conformal theory have this extra core. That's what it means on a sphere. In freedom Okay. It's ironic because it's the rule is that it's true on R across the sphere, and then this thing happens to be zero on a sphere alone. So I mean, I I think I think it's a standard. Thing. If you look at um, what was this Mandel's book? I, I can send you the reference. You can see it's an appendix. They just go through the argument and say you need this this term. Okay. And when you say you've done a lot of plotting, also of graphs of like the spectrum of the Laplacian. When you say the spectrum of that, I mean, obviously, you, I jump to eigenvalues of, you know, certain functions, but I don't understand how, how did we change the spectrum? We've added a term to, like, the effective. We did the spectrum. We never, well, first of all, we always do an intuitive of course. We didn't have this term. We said this to zero, this to zero, this to zero. We just did this term. And you see, if this, look at it. If this does not depend on position, then this is definitely zero. So there's no question that this term by itself has in the jargon a zero mode, okay? Okay. That from the point of view of the original theory in flat space, mapping to this compact manifold, it shouldn't be zero. Anyway, this is the reason that the sphere is not like a torus. Because the torus has a translation around the two loops, okay? Mm -hmm. If there's no translation operator around the sphere, it's the group operator. It's, it's a subtle issue. It's, this is by no means, and this okay. is so long to understand it. But this Ricci term is a known term in a conformal yeah, limit yeah. of a free theory. Okay. I, 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 would... I, I know the argument, and I've read it many times. And sometimes you can read a math argument to, to your blue in your face and still don't feel that you really got it. And I, I can confess that that's the case. I actually think that there's no topological reason for this. And I think that. If you go to supersymmetry, you might find a reason for it, but then you would have to ask why is it there without supersymmetry? I don't think this is well understood. I don't even the people who claim to understand it. I'm not convinced. <laughs> okay, so 
I'll sorry, I, maybe I wasn't clear enough. I'm so I'm I'm okay with accepting the Ricci term exists there because some some post, some it's been proven somewhere else. What I mean is you were showing us a lot of plots before of let's say how the before you did the finite element analysis, your your the the spectrum of the of the Laplacian, like the spherical harmonics where they should have lied were different. When you say the spectrum, what or what are you yeah, plotting no, that, at that the height? Is, the spectrum of this operator, actually the, 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 the partial the u partial v the, with the g u news. Okay. Well, actually, I mean you have to you have to get the operator, so you have to take the derivative respect of um, i, so it's del squared pi. Okay, it's great by part. So the when you say the portion, the full partial squared. Okay. Yeah, I mean you you actually have to integrate the parts and then take. Yeah, the yeah, sure, sure, sure. So so in flat space, this is del squared by zero, right? Solve it with um, four modes, define a zero mode, k okay, to the zero. Okay. You, you do L squared on a sphere. It's actually the angular momentum operator, so it's L squared by, and the spectrum is L times L plus one. And you will find, of course, that there is a zero mode in this thing, in this operator. And not surprisingly, this is zero mode. Look at if this thing it's obvious. If these are constants across the sphere, this is zero. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Right. So. It's no question that it's a zero mode, but what I what I was showing was that actually the spectrum, uh, forgetting about whether there's a zero or not, um, which is actually correct for that operator, the spectrum is very good. So the spectrum started off this way without the finite element weights, and then it turned into this nice set of levels, L, you know, two, three, five, seven, eight, nine, right? So these are the, um, these are the, uh, 2L plus 1. And then I showed you that even if a good fit to this, this was L times L squared plus 1. So, you know, to 10 to, 10 to the minus 5, this is exactly the right spectrum. Now, whether it comes down to 0, that's this question of an extra term. Okay. I just okay. adjusted. Um, this was just because I didn't have the reach term. Oh, I, I think I might get it now. So, oh. now, if I had the reach term, it would be a quarter here, just by definition. So, so you, you now, you, you, the, the thing that what's causing the shift from L times L plus one to the other things is, or before on that previous graph, you were just showing with the tower of one, three, five, seven, yes. what was causing the shift was the fact that you were using a discretized Laplace, Laplacian rather than exact, and you were comparing, right. you know, okay. So that, so that's that yeah, now it, on the. So this is the naive discretization where you just use lattice uh, graph. This is actually called the graph Laplacian. Got it. The graph Laplacian, Laplacian with equal weights, and people make a big. You can look up the graph Laplacian. And every computer scientist has studied this on every possible graph. Okay. Okay. Actually, so now, I, and sorry. this is the finite element Laplacian. Right. So now I've now I've narrowed the question down more. So. This this is different than I thought they were the same. This is different than the L L plus one goes to L plus one half squared. I thought they were the same thing. So this is this is finite element yeah, Laplacian versus true. continuous. This makes sense. This is finite elements, and and uh, the, the 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 thing I mean, I, look at I don't think that any of this thing is is I mean I'm not saying things that I think are false, but it's not obvious. See, this thing is correctly zero um, in two D. There is no region. Change. 3D, the Laplace part on the sphere has a gap. I mean, that you have to just go read the GI. And then, and, I, and as I say, I mean, I really, I want, I'm going to go back to this thing and see if I can figure out what I was going to call up, but of course, my name is Cambridge and England. Okay, I got it now. When you're, when you're doing the Laplacian on, you know, a non flat surface with some sort of Ricci curvature, it's going to shift the spectrum. Right. So now let me tell okay, you. Okay. The, I'll tell you, the, the, I don't want to overload the, the gotcha. The strange thing about it is that you need this term in the pure uh, scalar term. If you drop all of this, actually like drop this, okay? You need this term before you do quantum physics, okay? Strangely enough, you can drop this term when you turn on quantum fluctuations. It's just not advisable. So that's why we were so confused by this. You can actually drop this term. It only see what happens if you drop this term, and I, I don't. I, I talked to many people. Nobody really understood this. So this is not the 
it thickens up. When you drop that term, it is still true that these curves will go to the right answer. In the judgment, it's irrelevant. It's just not that irrelevant. Okay. There's irrelevant and there's very small. Lab theories, of course, people are continually trying to do better than the minimal action. They try to put terms in which make the thing um, converge as rapidly as possible. And they're called improved actions. Got it. So we call this, and we should, we could say that we have discovered that on a sphere in three dimensions, we should use a Ricci improved action. And, and that, uh, that and expectation is, value at the bottom was for what purpose? Just to give the magnitude of the correction from that term? Well, since we already had these large computations already done when we were leaving it off, rather than having to run for another three months, we wanted to check whether this term was the explanation of what we're seeing. Okay. And we know how to do lattice perturbation theory for this operator. So we did a numerical lattice perturbation theory for this operator and found that sure enough, it goes straight through the points when you get close. Story. We have found out why this thing is taking its. See, this is the problem. Look at this damn exponent. This this infinite slope. We're trying to we're trying to extrapolate to this code without the green line. How could you be very confident this is the right answer? It could be up here. It could be down here. <laughs> you know, you wiggle these points a little bit. You have something that's going parallel. You know, I mean. It actually does coincide with zero at that point, but it's going to be extremely hard. You simply, you, you, when you have an improved action, people like to actually get rid of the linear term and get only the squared term. But to have something that's like a square root is a disaster. So this is a situation, it's the first situation I've seen in lattice field theory where an improvement scheme was not only desirable, it's essentially you have to do it or you're just not going to get good answers. We, we, we got into this partly because of the four point function and the four point function, because it has four legs uh, here, it was off by a factor of three. <laughs> okay. That's crazy. Eventually, I think it would have gotten the right answer if we could take the lattice spacing to 10 to the minus 10. Right? It showed that the thing was completely toothless. It would just be awful. So anyway, look at what, when is this uh, time up here? I don't want to get into anybody's uh, supper time. Um, who's monitoring me? I think Paul is, but he texted me. He was going to go get. Some, he was making bread. So I'm, I'm still uh, here. Oh, he's there. Okay. I, I, mean, I, I can finish this quickly or, uh, as people wish. What I thought I would do is, is just give you a feeling of where we're going to go next, which is um. Everyone is invited to join us. Uh, it's a lot of fun. Um, it's kind of reinventing lattice case theory. So I actually think that while it's it's not easy, it allows you to think anew about the things that have done uh, in the past. And indeed, we are basically reinventing all the standard methods. Sometime with almost no change at all, and sometime with little tweaks. But it actually is a very good exercise. The side being able to solve things on curved surfaces. I'm mean, actually just say conformal field theories on spheres is the way most theorists have gained really deep insight into it. So we're meeting the theorists halfway in the numerical methods, which is really important actually. I mean we can find we can test all kinds of things which are not in fact entirely known. So called central charges, um, uh, A theorems, there's all kinds of theorems that have not been proven, sometimes they have been which I think if we really pull this off, we can test. So I think, uh, how much, do I have a little more time just to give you a sort of future view? Yeah, uh, yeah you still have, uh, you have till 6.30, so. Okay, good, so this is fine. So look, the, 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 I mean, this could, this, of course, you can think about the future and you can go all, all sorts of ways, but let me just say for one, it should be maybe not clear, but, we have a manifold, it's two dimensions, it can be any dimensions. We can follow now a sort of set of steps. We first take this manifold and we discretize it 
in two dimensions with triangles and three dimensions with tetrahedrons. We can apply finite elements. There are rules to do this, which I think you know we've got a, a good set of rules in many ways. We will be able to get the classical theory. From the classical theory, we can see whether it gets the smooth classical solutions. We can test, you know, check things like spectra. Then we will find that there are ultraviolet problems. I think we can do this in general. We can find the graphs that are causing the problems. We can correct it. So if in fact this is typical, which is of course always a the question, I think this can be applied to essentially any normalizable quantum field theory. And I just give you a, a, a very quick view of it. It turns out that finite elements, this is not all the uh, rust, but finite elements can be um, applied to the gauge action. Here's the finite element uh, rule, and it's not going to be obvious to tell you what it is. But, I'm sorry, no, this is the FF dual term. Excuse me. Um, yeah, this is the FF dual term. With finite elements, there's a rule for these coefficients. You can get the exact um, finite element term. Um, okay, so this is j equal to zero. This is a finite element thing which we had to invent for fermions. It turns out that in fermions on curved space, you need something called the spin connection. So we've defined a discrete version of the spin connection, which, by the way, amazingly enough, had not been defined in the literature. It's kind of a surprise. This is called a verbine. This is a spin connection. Um, oh yeah, this is the gauge theory for the plaquette. This is the uh, area and volume terms. They've gotten much the same way. This is a dual. Um, so we can do gauge theories. We can do fermions. Um, okay, this is just algebra. Blah, blah, blah. This is the spin connection. I'll tell you how it's done. But the spin connection is actually important because a fermion defines a direction with a spinner, and that direction has to be related to the uh, vectors on the sort of tangent plane. And that is not natural to do in a specific way on a curved surface. So you have to have a general gauge, spin gauge field to do that. We figured out how to do it. So I think, I think we can write any classical action. Um, you can go to higher dimensions. <laughs> um, you might want to know what is the platonic solid for a three sphere? See, we had a sphere of two dimensions. A three sphere is something which is a two dimensional sphere is, is a vector of three dimensions held to be unit length, right? And a three dimensional sphere is a vector of four dimensions that held to be uh, a unit length. In fact, the symmetries of the three sphere are the Euclidean Lorentz group. It turns out that the best tessellation that's regular of a three sphere has 600 equilateral tetrahedrons filling the sphere. Uh, it's kind of amazing because that and it's it's exactly the analog of icosahedron, except where it has 600 uh, elements rather than 20. The group a symmetry of it is 14,400 uh, symmetries. And one thing that I found very amusing, it's, it's great because all of this is old mathematics, so you get to read all kinds of old things. It turns out that Aristotle convinced people for, I don't know, about 20 centuries everybody believes Aristotle, that if you packed tetrahedrons into flat space, it just filled it perfectly. And the problem is that he didn't know math accurately enough. It turns out that if you put five tetrahedrons together, uh, swing them around an edge, they don't quite fill out the full 2 pi rotation. They're actually very close. In radians, they're 0 0.02, they're 2% off. And the fact that they don't quite fit is the reason that you have to fold them into a sphere to get them to fit. And so this is a very nice um, thing. By the way, this is the graph, if you can see it. Uh, you should go to um, Wikipedia and look for the 600 cell when you're um, in need of um, visual distraction. It's great. Um, it's a, there's a whole art form of, of mapping these 600 cells. Anyway, we can do this. We can go up one dimension, which is very useful because r cross three—that's the four dimensions of space-time for particle physics. So we can we can do this on four-dimensional theories. That work. Um, then uh, the other thing we can do is we can do hyperbolic spaces. It turns out hyperbolic spaces have open you up to a very nice um, uh, theory of triangulation. It turns out that um, 
on spheres, there's a sum rule that says that you can only have um, vertices with three, four, or five times of meter of thing. This is the icosahedron. This is the uh, octahedron, meaning four ways. And this is the tetrahedron. So there are exactly three ways to tessellate the triangle, the equilateral triangle is a sphere. There's exactly one way to do the plane that's flat. And there's an infinite number of ways to tessellate hyperbolic space. And anybody who's seen Escher diagrams have already seen these, as Escher of these things. Here's, here's Escher's diagram. This is a tessellation, uh, the so-called 237 tessellation. And if you look at it, you'll discover that there are triangles made up of six of these. Oh, yeah. Let's see if I can find it. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, this is good for late at night. Let's try to figure out. Um, six of these things make a cloud of the yeah. Oh, yeah. Can you see my cursor? Oh, did somebody say yes? Yeah. That, that is an equilateral triangle, okay? And remember, I pointed out that the natural thing, even on a triangular lattice, is to subdivide an equilateral triangle into six pieces by drawing uh, perpendiculars to the other side. So this is an equilateral hyperbolic triangle. And what Escher is doing is, is using this uh, mapping to the uh, Poincaré disk where the metric is being hidden by squishing it to the edge, but each one of these triangles is metrically identical. So you have to think of this triangle as it slides to the edge of actually being larger, and in fact, hyperbolic space is infinite. So this is a triangulation of hyperbolic space. This is flat space. This is um, uh, the sphere where we started. Only you can't, here you can go to infinite triangulations, which is sort of interesting. And uh, we've been exploring that. Uh, you can also um, write this as a cylinder. The way you can do it, you can have a, a hyperbolic trans, um, space here and a cylinder. And this is called global ADS. So if you want to do non perturbative calculations in a data set of space to try to show some of the um, ADS CFT um, correspondences, uh, we have a paper doing this tessellation. No, no Monte Carlo calculations yet. Lots of open problems. This is an infinite space, but surprisingly enough, if you cut off the triangles at a fixed radius, uh, they still very accurately map onto the boundary because the boundary is treated as a fixed size circle. And you can see that as they go out, you get more and more points on the boundary. So the ADS CFT does not require a, a, a huge lattice. Uh, this is the tessellation of the ADS space. We can do this is um this is the original triangulation. This is the symmetric triangulation, and then this is finite elements. This is the dispersion relation, so to speak, in ADS space. Uh, you can go to it as I say, a cylinder. You got a Hamiltonian. Da da da. We're doing this for um, we can do correlation functions. Anything you can do in any. Smooth manifold, we can do over here. Uh, this is like asking for funds. <laughs> um, so uh, I think for, uh, okay, I, I, this is in the, uh, I hope, sort of uh, visual entertainment uh, class. Let me um, make a remark on what I didn't talk about at this school, but I think um, some people should. Maybe someone is. Is someone talking about quantum computing? Um, you know, Joel, is still there? No. Is anybody there? I don't know. Maybe he's not paying attention. <laughs> say, say we're here. It just, it just it just takes a minute to uh, to, to respond. Anyway, I I I um as Joel Joel is also working on this. You know, there's a whole bunch of people who have gotten very um interested in well, quantum computing goes back, by the way, to who else but Feynman. You can't get away from Feynman. No, let me um, 
just to give five minutes do since I told people to get away from finding the again so I should uh, I should uh, I'm gonna put out of everything first now it's interesting 60 years ago this is older than Wilson lattice day step okay Maybe we shouldn't use conventional computers. Now, the main reason, by the way, for it, the difficulty is I started off by saying that we have this trick of getting rid of the I in front of the unitary evolution, either the I, T, H, but we are doing the wrong problem. The real problem is a unitary transformation with the Hamiltonian. And that problem cannot be done on a class computer with any hope at all so far, probably never. Because what happens is that you have to evolve in a huge state. You have to have all of the states that the quantum theory can possibly get into, which is exponentially large in terms of the number of um, uh, variables it exponentiates. And you also have to evolve with phase coherence that is across this thing, which is very, very good because quantum mechanics requires this fantastic particle uh, quantum duality, you know, there's the cancellations between different paths, and it's only the sum over many, many paths that give you the coherent effects, that give you whatever you want to call it, you know, single double slit experiment and so on. So in order to do quantum computing, you have to have a quantum computer, really. And I've been in 1959 already, said that um, he thought this was some um, possible to have quantum computers. The interesting thing is when I started to get into this, I'd actually, um, by accident with Uwe Wiese um, and Shailish, had written, rewritten um, QCD in a totally quantum computing formulation. We weren't trying to do quantum computing, we just actually did this. And what you have to do is you have to write every single variable as a discrete fermionic operator. I, I can't go through the whole reasons for doing that, but I can't. But when I got into this thing, I was cleaning up my office, and this is just too amusing to me. And I was thinking in my office and I was trying to show that this method that we had, I could get, write everything in terms of sigma matrices. And then I, I read this uh, prescient thing from Feynman. He says, the question is, if we wrote a Hamilton, uh, as I said, you can write many, many discretizations which are going to give you the same filter. So this goes back to this question of how many ways can you change the problem and still get the same answer? So he's thinking very clearly about this. The question is, if we wrote the Hamiltonian, it's involved only Pauli matrices. So now every single operator only is a two-state thing. It's like an electron. It just can reorient the direction of an electron, of an electron light variable. He says, uh, locally coupled to corresponding operators on another space-time point, can we imitate every quantum mechanical system, I think he really needs field there, uh, which is discrete and has a finite number of degrees of freedom. And no Certainly, that we do this for any quantum mechanical system which involves bosons. I was just sitting down, and I think I have a theorem that shows that we can do this for fermions. So I believe I can answer this question with fermions. I'm not sure fermion particle. I'm about to write an article. Uh, particles could be described by such a system. So I leave this open. So I, I found this in the bottom of um, you know <laughs> boxes of junk, and I thought, hey, this is good. It's still a problem. So. Of course, quantum computing is very complicated. The machines are lovely. Here's a machine from IBM. But more, uh, and this is just a few qubits. You know, each qubit is like a gate, a quantum gate. Now, there's actually um, a guy at Harvard. This is a Harvard graduate student. Uh, and uh, they have a quantum computer. This is a quantum computer. And it's more powerful in some ways than the IBM one because it's a trapped ion experiment. So the computer is here. It's an array of atoms all sitting in a lattice, a square lattice, more or less. And um, You can set that array into an initial state and then say go. And since it is, in fact, a quantum state, it evolves as a quantum computer, partially programmable. All these things, lasers and so on. This is actually, I would think, an experimentalist dream that, you know, you could actually make a um, of advanced experiment with Legos, basically. Um, so we're, we're in the process of trying to, now here you have to do a funny thing. These computers are only able to do very, very simple problems. So you don't take your favorite program problem to the computer and say, I'm gonna solve it. 
you go to the computer or the device and you say, what are the problems you can solve? And then you try to pick a problem that you care about from that. It's all done in reverse direction. But anyway, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. And uh, the, only, um, the only thing I'll say is that it turns out that you can show that yeah, you can show the problem. You can show and that the gauge links that are usually written as SU3 matrices can be written as bilinears or fermions. This was this thing that Uli Wiesel and Charles and I did. We showed that the entire algebraic structure of the Wilson theory is not dependent on having SU3 matrices on a link. It can have an anti-fermion fermion destruction operator, construction operator. These have the color indices I and J. And we showed that algebraically, this has exactly the same algebraic properties for the Hamiltonian as the so-called total Susskind version of the Wilson lattice. So, with a lot of um, qualitative reasoning, we believe that this is also a legitimate version of lattice gauge theory. And in basically the same sense that the IC model, which is after all just discrete, in fact, if you write the IC model Hamiltonian, it also just involves these signal matrices. So the IC model Hamiltonian is just a bunch of signal matrices, and yet it is believed to be the same as 5 4 theory. So we are making the same leap of faith here that we can rewrite QCD in this form. And the advantage is that each one of these things, um, what happens, I'm sorry, let's see anything. Yeah, it's here. What happens is in this operator, yeah, in this operator, what happens is that a plaquette, instead of having continuous variables, has occupation, has fermions that hop around. So a, a given length, for example, in QCD would have three uh, colored fermions and three anti fermions. So it'd have six fermions. Each link would be populated by six. So there could be up to three here and up to three here, but they always have. Um, they have a con conservation to the gauge invariance, so there's always one red green. And what happens when you apply a plaquette, the bead square term, is it shuttles these beads around, shuttles these beads around. So basically, we've turned the QCD problem, I call it the quantum of octopus. We turned it into a thing where you have fermions hopping around on the grid. And in principle, when someone builds the quantum computer, which is not going to happen when you have probably any of our lifetimes, we'll have to see. Uh, you could do this on a quantum computer. So it's a lot of fun. And strangely enough, um, I think there's a kind of overlap of the algebra. So I think of that as, a, as an intriguing thing. Anyway, look, it was fun. I hope uh, it was useful. And I hope, are there any more questions? The questions are better, I think, than the, this topic. Is anybody talking about quantum computing uh, this time, uh, Joe? He's gone. He's gone. Yeah, no, 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 he's he's not in the chat. He had to go to uh, take his car to the car dealership for for. Oh, yeah, I know. You know it's funny. Last time he was fixing his car, maybe this is a constant in the motion. Um, well, yeah, maybe you've just okay. Become, anyway, uh, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording, but you can uh, keep going. Yeah, sure.